Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Berlin Science Week and the conservation um, event that ICW and uh, with the cooperation of the Zoo and Tier Park of Berlin has organized. So we are very happy to be here with you. And we have uh, 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 great uh, um, speakers coming up today. So happy that you joined. So to make a bit more interactive, we also want to know who you are kind of, and uh, why you're joining us. And we would like you to uh, invite you to, to join us for this little uh, survey where you share with us just um, where you're from. So we know more or less where the country, like where the people are from that are uh, watching us and um, what you do, also your age, if you're willing to share it, it would be very nice. To do that, you just have to go I hope you can all see my monitor. You can all go to uh, menti.com and then you put this code and there you can uh, share with us a bit of your information. So we also get to know where you're from. So uh, the Berlin Science Week um, gathers a lot of scientists that are based in Berlin. So uh, we at the ICW, the Institute of um, Zoo and Wildlife Research, we are conservation oriented and we, you will get to see with the, many of the speakers um, the job that we do there to help preserve a bit more of the ecosystem and earth. Um, I would like to just let you know that we will have seven speakers. All the speakers will have around 20 minutes of, uh, of a talk. And um, then you will have the chance to put some questions um, and that will be answered uh, by the speakers in the end of their talk. For that, you can write on the YouTube uh, uh, channel and we will have then someone selecting you the best questions or your questions and then um, putting them to the, to the, to the, to the speaker in, in question. Um, and yeah. And that's it so far. I would also like to share with you the, um, the talks that will be, pre that will be presented. Um, so we will have uh, Dr. Harry Bethofer. Uh, he will be talking to us on uh, conservation done at ICW. What are the goals of the Institute and the future visions for it? And then we'll have uh, Professor Dr. Thomas Hildebrandt that will also talk on uh, some of his conservation projects and uh, it will be approaching also the new technologies and advanced uh, in this field. And then we will have uh, the doctorate, um, Andrew Tilka. He will be uh, telling us on conservation projects in Asia, uh, more um, specifically in, in Vietnam. And then we will have Stephen Sitt, he will be telling us on the, what is a successful science communication that is done at uh, Leibniz ICW and, um, and uh, we'll have like a practical guide or a behind the scenes talk. And following we will have Jan Sfeeling and he will tell us on uh, the visual storytelling for research and conservation. Um, then we will have Sonia Fontes, me, and I will tell you about a bit about of the um, zoo research that is done uh, and how the elephant zoo research contributes to the um, to the conservation of the wild elephants and then we'll have Katrina Erman and she will talk talk to us about the conservation work done at the zoo Berlin and at Tia Park Berlin so with all of the speakers more or less introduced I am very happy to see that you're very active we have a lot of people Germany Portugal Poland and with this, I would like uh, to start actually introducing the first speaker. So we start our, uh, our presentations. So the first speaker is the director of the Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Disease, um, uh, which is a, a member of the Leibniz uh, Institute Association. He is a behavioral ecologist by training and uh, he has uh, undergraduate studies in biology and physiology at University of Saarland and has a doctorate in uh, zoology from the Oxford University. His research focuses on the behavioral, ecology and conservation of mammals and particularly in carnivores and evolutionary epidemi epidemiology of wildlife pathogens 
stress and animal welfare. Also in illegal hunting and resolving conservation conflicts by stakeholder-led participation. He has initiated and led long-term research projects in Tanzania, in Spotted Hyenas, African Wild Dog, and in Namibia in Cheetahs, and lived for 12 years as a scientist in the Serengeti in East Africa. He supports the development of an evidence-based and integrated conservation approach and of gender equality in science and conservation. He is also a conservation fellow of the Zoological Society London, of London and a member of the Board of Trustees of WWF Germany. Dr. Hofer, the screen is yours. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is a brilliant uh, idea of Sonia Jesus Fontes from, from Portugal, and we have a bit of time to talk about conservation science today. And it is my task to introduce the whole topic and to mention con uh, and to explain what the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research does in terms of conservation science. Our mission really is quite simple but difficult to realize because it's such a comprehensive mission it's simply to understand and to improve the adaptability of wildlife in the context of global change there's simply no place on the planet left that hasn't been affected by humans one way or the other but it's not just understanding which is typical for scientists it's more than that um, it's also improving the adaptability of wildlife and by this we mean conservation in the sense of developing scientific bases improving the viability of threatened species and of biodiversity in general. I think it's worth uh, thinking a moment of why conservation activities need conservation science. And this, there's a simple answer. Yes, it does. And it needs it for several reasons. First of all, there needs to be somebody who provides an in-depth understanding of the adaptability of species and species diversity to identify previously unrecognized problems in conservation, then to develop solutions that does not necessarily need science, but often is helped by science, and also to test novel approaches to solve current issues, about which we will hear some, some more details later on. And finally, and this is most certainly a, a scientific approach, is to think about the future, whether today's solutions will actually be sustainable um, in the future. So yes, conservation does need science. And I'm going to illustrate this with some of the work of our institute. We are possibly the world's largest wildlife conservation research institute there is. And we do lots of things with more than 220 people, all based in Berlin. But today, I'll just talk about four examples. And I'll mention a fifth example, which my colleague, Professor Hildebrand, will uh, detail in, um, later on. So I'll start out with preparing the basis. Uh, looking at the Iberian lynx, the most um, endangered cat in the world. And it's worth noting that this is not in any other continent but in Europe because it lives on the Iberian Peninsula. It was affected by fragmentation, poisoning, illegal hunting, but also the loss of its prey population. Uh, this is the first example. The second one will be to show you that a novel issue where conservation matters, a conflict between people and wildlife has been identified in the issue of the setting up of wind energy plants in Germany. A third uh, example will show you how we can develop solutions to conservation problems using the example of the Namibian cheetah, which uh, have been persecuted by farmers who have hunted them because they are afraid to take their cattle. I will just mention here the option of testing novel alternatives, but I will not actually talk about this, but I believe that Thomas Hildebrand will say more about this. And finally, I'll conclude with another topic where Borneo will use, be used as an example, where we look at to what extent today's reserves provide protection for bats, monkeys, and carnivores in 50 or 100 years' time. Okay, let's start with uh, the Iberian lynx, the most threatened wildcat worldwide. There's lots of problems. As I said, everywhere else there's masses of wild rabbits, but of all the places in southern Spain and Portugal, this is where that uh, po uh, population has crashed. 
There's also the issue of maintaining and restoring these habitats. There's the issues of minimizing risks, and there's uh, trying to educate the general public to be sympathetic towards its fate. And what we've done here in particular, we've helped and assisted and designed and worked on the conservation breeding in captivity. And once this would be successful, to help subsequent releases back into the wild. So this is what I'll be concentrating on. This meant to unravel the details and the basics of reproduction biology of uh, the Iberian lynx. And this worked beyond all <coughs> expectations so that uh, soon after the beginning of the captive breeding program in 2004, five years later, we were in the situation that for the very first time, a captive born animal could be reintroduced to the uh, southern Iberian Peninsula. And that uh, release program has continued since and has been wildly successful, partly because the whole region is proud of the lynx, so the education program work, and also partly because um, and the rabbit population has been restocked and the population has been better protected. So the first successful release was in December 2010, uh, 2010 and ever since there have been many more lynxes released and are monitored. Really, the point here, and this is something that over specific conservation uh, projects is often far, uh, mentioned far too little, the basis for this success was really that different elements came together. Environmental protection, conservation breeding, protection in the wild, communication, and research all together meant that this program became successful. Now, the second thing is something where I would not want to show how science can unravel or identify new problems. And this is what we call a green-green dilemma because the wind energy plants, there's about 30,000 of them now in Germany, are meant to provide sustainable energy resources. Yet, at the same time, we have bats that are killed near wind energy plants. And this is something that, uh, in a sense, uh, science has discovered and that is still not being taken seriously or recognized in the wider general public. So I'd just like to share with you some rather horrible pictures to give you a sense of just how important this is. They, the bats can either be killed directly by colliding with these um, wind energy plants or indirectly by being, being taken apart through a biotrauma um, when they come in the vicinity of these. So in, in other words, they're being uh, pulled apart uh, from the inside. So our guess is that is something in the order of at least 10 bats a year being killed by a wind plant as we have 30,000. There's an estimate that there are more than 300,000 bats are now being killed every year in Germany by the wind energy plants alone. And perhaps worse, if you look at the right hand side on the graph, you can see that at a distance here of one kilometer, um, yeah, <clears throat> males and females are equally likely to be in the vicinity of a wind energy plant. If you now follow the red line of the females, the closer that you get to the wind energy plant, the more likely the females actually will stay there. And this is a problem. Females, in a sense, are being attracted to wind energy plants and thus suffer in particular. Is there anything we can do about it? Well, if we look closely at how back and activity on the one hand and energy production and wind energy plants on the other hand operate, we see that there's a very interesting situation. So bats are mostly active at very low wind speeds, which is the uh, bottom half of this graph, and wind energy plants at very low wind speeds, of course, find it very difficult to produce any kind of electrical energies. They're far happier at higher wind speeds. So we actually have a small overlap only at which uh, bats suffer from encountering moving wind energy plant turbines. So it would be possible, in principle, if the energy production was reduced by approximately 1% to save most of the bat lives. And it'll be interesting to see to what extent this will be implemented in the future. Now I'm coming to um, my third topic, which is explaining how you can uh, solve a conservation problem that's been there for many years. Throughout the world, farmers and livestock owners don't like carnivores because they eat livestock. And particularly in Namibia, cheetahs and also leopards are thought to attack and kill um, livestock and domestic animals. And that 
uh, farmers and livestock owners solve that problem as they see it by persecuting them, by trapping them and then shooting them. And as we discovered from talking to them, two major issues for them was the density of cheetahs and their estimate of the density of cheetahs on the land was higher than it turned out to be, but for interesting reasons, and also the diet of cheetahs, just how much uh, proportion, how high a proportion would the livestock be part of a cheetah's diet. So in order to do that, we needed to study the movements and relocate the cheetahs and try and find as many cheetahs as was possible in a, a study area. And so we, we caught um, the cheetahs in traps, tagged them with radio collars, and then located them by air. At the same time, we've also spent a lot of effort and time building up trust with the, the farmers in Namibia, trying to understand their issue and their attitudes and inviting them to join them uh, and participate in our scientific research. So I'm, I'm emphasizing here, this was not a conservation project. I'm saying this is a conservation research project. And so the farmers actually told us point blank, they really don't like conservationists, but they didn't mind working with scientists. As it turned out, we discovered that often the farmers would place the cattle herds, as you can see here in white, in a particular area where many cheetahs would be, uh, where there would be high cheetah activity. In this graph, symbolized by the very red um, shade of the picture. And you see the around in green, the cheetahs are much less common. The individual lines are movements of individual cheetahs. And during the calving period, of course, if there's a coincidence of cheetahs being highly active in a particular area and the calves being born in this area, as you can see in the table, the calf losses would be high. So what we suggested to them was during the calving period, move the herds out of that area, put them somewhere else. And if they did that, and that was just a few kilometers further away, there was no calf losses anymore. Of course, you might argue that the cheetahs will soon discover that the um, calves are somewhere else, but in fact, they know it, but they don't care. They simply eat what remains in terms of wildlife in the area that they focus on in their activities. So it's worked, the losses have been reduced, and the farmers have changed their attitude towards cheetahs and now kill far fewer of, uh, of them uh, as a result of the scientific research. Now, finally, um, my last point refers to looking at a greater spatial and temporal distance or dimension, let's simply ask the, the question to what extent the current protected areas in Borneo, an area, a, a large island divided between three states, how that protected area would uh, do for carnivores, monkeys and bats. And by doing this, looking into the future, you have to do some mathematical modeling and for that, you need to make some assumptions. And our key assumptions for that was to say, right, we'll assume that climate change continues and we use some of the worst cases, so the worst changes in climate uh, of general models that are out there. And we also assume that the human population would continue to grow, particularly on the coast, and that there would be substantial changes in land use as a result of it. Currently in Borneo, about 15% of the area is protected uh, in some sort of way, but 85% of the area, of course, is outside protected areas. When you do this modeling, you need to collect a lot of information about the distribution of uh, the animals concerned. So that was a lot of hard work collating this information on 23 carnivores, 13 primates, and 45 bats. And after a long and careful work on environmental variables, the climate models, the location of water bodies, wetlands, casts, and so on, um, we came up with a final distribution. And so we discovered that the key areas that I look uh, on the map shown here in lilac at present, uh, together with the national parks, continue to shift slightly in other areas from those that were present. So the question then was, those areas that were identified as the key areas, what habitats uh, do cover them. And here in that graph, I'd like to point you towards the center part of the graph, this very sort of odd looking green part. This is the area, which is the largest area, um, which is actually currently uh, being handled as uh, prime rainforest areas that have been given to logging concessions where uh, companies can log 
and take woods out. So in other words, the key to the conservation of Bornean carnivores, monkeys and bats will be in the way the logging concessions will be implemented. If they're being implemented in a sort of sustainable fashion, then the carnivores, monkeys and bats might have a chance. And if they don't, then they don't. So in other words, the areas that are currently not under protection but are being given over to forestry purposes hold the key to the conservation and the continued viability of Bornean mammals. Okay, I've given you in a bit of a, a quick talk four examples that I think illustrates not only our approach to conservation science, but also shows that work can start at the very basics with understanding the basics of reproductive biology, helping with the integrated conservation approach, by identifying the dimensions of a problem in the case of the clashes between bats and wind energy plants, to finding novel solutions as in the case of uh, um, uh, the Namibian farmers, where we recommended changes in herd management, all the way to looking and peeking at the future and identifying the key habitats that hold the key to the continued survival and viability of wildlife populations, which we all love and cherish. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions if you have any. Thank you, Haribet, for the great talk. Um, yeah, we have a question from Jan. <laughs> um, hi, all. A question to Mr. Hofer. Environmental change is accelerating, and the pace of change is tremendous. How can science keep up and develop solutions in time? Well, um, just because the pace of uh, environmental change is accelerating doesn't mean that science can't do anything. But the key for the future, apart from solving technical problems, some of which I've shown here, is also to do what I've shown with the Namibian farmer, which is that wildlife conservation science needs to talk to stakeholders involved in all the conflicts. And so far, conservation science has spent too little effort in actually speaking and conversing to stakeholders. Stakeholders are stakeholders because they have particular interests at heart, not necessarily finding out the truth, which is what the scientists need to do. So the, the solution that we have is combine our technical excellence in doing scientific work with going with an open heart and mind to the stakeholders, talk to them about the issues, and work together in solving the issues. That is the one sustainable way forward that I see. OK, we don't have any other questions. Um, so we can move on to the next presenter, which is Thomas. Mm. Sarah, we can't hear you. Uh, the next speaker will be the uh, Professor Dr. Thomas Hildebrandt. And um, uh, Professor uh, Thomas is a head of the Department of Reproduction Management at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife uh, Research. He has studied veterinary medicine at the Humboldt University in Berlin, has received his doctorate summa cum laude from the Freie University of Berlin, and is a certificated as a zoo, wildlife and game veterinarian. In his special field, uh, reproduction biology, he is one of the pioneers of assisted reproduction in large mammals, including elephants, rhinos, big cats, and panda bears. Professor of Wildlife Reproduction Medicine at the Freie University of Berlin, he is also represented in a number of prof professional societies. He is a honorary professor, uh, professor, sorry, professor fellow life science at the Melbourne University and is a research associated 
of the uh, Semyotian uh, Institutes at the National Zoological Park. He is also a fellow of the Zoological Society of San Diego Zoo, a scientific associate of the Taronga, Taronga Conservation Society in Australia, and a conservation fellow of the Zoological Society of London, and a veterinary advisor for the European Elephant Taxon Advisory Group. Thomas, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Sonia. That uh, are a lot of titles. I think um, we, we should uh, now uh, focus a little bit on a, a topic I like to present you in, a, in this 20 minute uh, time frame that uh, the classical conservation approaches are not more suitable for the current situation in the world. And um, uh, how I say that, um, this is a kind of graph uh, which demonstrates what's going on in the world right now. Um, the, the loss of biodiversity, that means uh, the loss of species which lived on our planet uh, for millions of years are extremely accelerated. And in the past, actually climate change was in the, in the mind of the common man and everyone thought climate change is the most, climate change is the most dramatic event. But I think COVID-19 has demonstrated how nature strikes back if we destroy biodiversity, we yeah, exploit uh, animals, sell them on wet markets, then uh, nasty germs will jump into the human society and we will pay uh, a lot of uh, a lot of debit for debit for that uh, because uh, the fixing the, the integrity of complex biosystem uh, cost us a lot of money and I think I will demonstrate you in the next uh, few minutes uh, what it takes uh, to repair some of these uh, dramatically damaged uh, biosystems and uh, nearly extinct them to save some of these nearly extinct species. Uh, here is an uh, example of what's going on for several Thomas? that's uh, we call that biocrime. Uh, Thomas? That is, uh, what? Um, we can't see your screen. Can oh, you, you can't see my screen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Really? We can't. Okay. Wait. Hmm. I did that. Now? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Oh, so then uh, I, I go quickly back. That, that's a graph uh, which uh, demonstrates the loss of uh, species, or we call it biodiversity. Uh, that this is a number one problem on our planet uh, uh, compared to the dimension of climate change. We will not uh, uh, ignore climate change, but actually the loss of biodiversity is the most pressing problem. And COVID-19 has demonstrated that very clearly uh, because disturbed biosystems release nasty germs and nasty germs cost the, the world a lot of money resources and will have a lot of victims uh, uh, due to the infections uh, which are going on. And COVID-19 is a recent one. We have HIV, which came out of uh, Central Africa. We have Ebola, which came out of Central Africa. So there is really a handful of very nasty diseases which are directly linked to habitat destruction. And here you see a an, uh, an short video about uh, of the biocrime, one of the most severe biocrime. People hunt uh, rhinos for their horn because they make a lot of money with that. Uh, I think uh, that demonstrates quite nicely uh, uh, how yeah, perverse actually uh, this uh, destruction of uh, nature is. Um, here is a graph which should uh, demonstrate what it takes uh, in our time now to perform conservation method. And uh, the first uh, uh, situation is the situation when Adam and Eve were still on the planet. They lived in together with all the species very nicely, so there was no reason uh, to protect anything. And uh, evolution combined with extinction and selection process were quite natural. However, that changed quite quickly 
when uh, the Industrial Revolution took place in the 19th century. And at the end of the 19th century, actually, the first protected area had to be uh, created by the 18th President of the United States, Uly Ulysses Seal. In 1872, he formed Yellowstone Park, the first national reserve in the world. And uh, that helped quite a lot, but shortly after, it was uh, quite obvious that we had to increase captive breeding to save some of the critical endangered species. And a very nice example for that is a Chowalski horse or the European bison, which were saved uh, by uh, forced captive breeding programs, mainly uh, uh, performed by zoological institutions. However, the destruction of nature went further on, and uh, we had to implement more techniques. For example, the black-footed ferret and the uh, Californian condor could be only saved because assisted reproduction techniques were heavily involved in the conservation project and in the breeding program to save this species. And now uh, we are at the point that we have some extremely endangered species, like the northern white rhino, I will tell you more about that, where we have to implement not only assisted reproduction, but also stem cell technology to create viable, genetic viable populations. Here yeah, is a, the is an event which really uh, shook up the world. That's the death of the last male northern white rhino, Sudan. He died in March 19, um, in March 19, in 2018. And uh, now we have only two female northern white rhino left on our planet. Uh, the northern white rhino is actually the biggest rhino. It lived on our planet for millions of years. And we, as humans, have uh, erased it, uh, which has quite a severe consequences for the complex ecosystem in Central Africa. And therefore, we have the mission to recreate a viable population and uh, produce sufficient number of rhinos to release them in the, in the wild. Before I can tell you the uh, single steps which are necessary for that, I want to give you another insight uh, how difficult our work actually is. Um, in a normal population, like the human population or a very uh, healthy wildlife population, and we have uh, bad breeders and we have good breeders. So the, the bad breeders would be in this point, uh, the very good breeders would be here, and the average uh, of the individuals produce uh, uh, yeah, in a human population maybe two, two offspring. Uh, in comparison, the livestock industry, which was bred for a massive reproduction event or a massive reproduction success, um, is uh, at the far end of this graph because uh, right now uh, a cattle bull can produce 200,000 offspring by using assisted reproduction technologies and frozen semen techniques. So the, the multiplication effect is quite dramatic. Now we're looking to our threatened species. They are very poor breeders. Why they are so poor breeders? Here are some of these uh, factors which uh, really have an impact. Uh, that is, for example, loss uh, of tradition or uh, behavior disorders, compromised immune system, loss of genetic variability. So there's a lot of factors which uh, uh, play a role when you try to save a critical endangered species. Here an example, this male rhino has never seen how to breed. So he jumps on the female from the wrong side. So this way you can't get pregnant. So animals are really need to learn how to, to behave. And that is, for example, a very critical point for the Northern White Rhino project. Uh, because uh, if we produce offspring uh, from the last two female rhinos, this offspring has to be teached by the two remaining rhinos how to behave as a northern white rhino, because the southern white rhino, the other subspecies, can't really transfer this specific knowledge how to act as a northern white rhino. Another factor is uh, if you have a very small population and very uh, less gene uh, variability, uh, then uh, there is a high likelihood 
uh, to have malformations like you see here in Indian rhinos. So we have to avoid that in a special program. And uh, the, the one of the last points I want to make for as a kind of precondition for such program is that uh, working with wild animals, you have to deal with their behavior. And in most of the cases, they will not be very friendly to you. So you have to anesthetize them. And I show you a quick If you anesthetize a two-ton patient, this was a male rhino which hasn't produced any offspring. So we checked his semen quality. In this case, we were not responsible for anesthesia, uh, but we came up with uh, a kind of technique to revive it. Um, the anesthesiologist actually is this uh, person, and after uh, <coughs> jumping uh, several times and giving the right luck, uh, our rhino actually uh, came up again and uh, half year later produced uh, two offspring in the uh, with a roommate uh, he lives. So uh, the explanation for that is that uh, it maybe was afraid to have another of these events. And the other uh, explanation a student came up with was uh, that it might uh, have some brain damage and like than the females. We don't know really the truth, but he developed to be one of the most successful Sausamite rhino breeding bull in Germany. Uh, but this Graph is only a quick note that uh, besides all these technology we can uh, implement, uh, we have not always the right solution. So if the solution is missing, we can put biological samples into liquid nitrogen and it will be alive for about 3,000 years because liquid nitrogen frees all biological activities so even next generation can work with this material and find solutions which we may be uh, incapable to find. Uh, but we also use uh, this technology, for example, collecting semen of rhinos in the wild in South Africa and then use it in European breeding programs and different zoos. And you see here one of our successes at the Budapest Zoo uh, where we uh, use such frozen semen and uh, we're capable to produce nice live offspring. It's a little bit more sensitive here. Or... Now we come back to our northern white rhinos. That's the two last northern white rhinos here at Olpeteta uh, in uh, Kenya. And uh, that was Fatu. She showed that she didn't like blood taking from the ear. Um, uh, we worked with them uh, quite intensively after we came up with this kind of strategic map uh, to, to recreate a viable population which is capable to be released into the wild. I will go only to one point, that is uh, in vitro fertilization using oocyte collection and uh, ICSI, that means sperm injection, into the oocyte and then embryo culture. Uh, all the other points would take too much time, but if you are interested, I can explain that later on to you uh, if you are interested on this topic. For harvesting oocytes in a rhino, you have to remember that the, the ovaries are about two meters inside, so we can't use any technology, existing technology for harvesting oocytes, like we apply in, in humans or in horses or in cattle. So we have to go through the rectum and then use a king needle, which is two, about two meter long, uh, to harvest follicles from the ovaries. And that uh, is quite a, a tricky intervention, but we performed this procedure more than 50 times uh, and are quite successful with that. Uh, the point, oops, here you see us uh, active in Kenya. Uh, when we did the first oocyte collection in the northern white rhinos in 2019. Since then, we have harvested 29 oocytes from these two females and have produced three first grade embryos. So the oocyte would look like this. That's an oocyte with a so-called cumulus. This is an oocyte, this little thing here in culture. Then it gets fertilized, it develops in an early embryo, which uh, then divided 
more and more by cleaving. And then you have a beautiful blastocyst, which is visible here. And this is a blastocyst when it is cryopreserved in liquid nitrogen. Our dream is uh, that this picture, it's an historical photo of the last mating in captivity in 1988, that this uh, photo will be realistic uh, again, uh, but in a different environment by using our technology uh, so that the rhinos can uh, mate again in the wild uh, and are rhinos like uh, they were a million years before. Another species I want to show you how, uh, uh, where we are quite active that uh, technology, technology can help to restore reproduction is a gorilla project here. Uh, the gorilla, in this case, a female gorilla had some tumor development in the uterus, uh, which made it infertile. And we used one of the most advanced technology to remove this uh, tumor without doing any harm to the female. That is a, a technique which is recently on the market. Uh, it's used endoscopy, uh, where we go into the uterus and it's a minimal invasive procedure. We uh, cut the, the tumor in little pieces and suck it out with vacuum. And at the end, the uterus is absolutely free of this tumor uh, tissue and is uh, fertile again. And uh, that it is fertile shows this uh, demonstration here. Uh, that's 3D images of growing primate fetuses after such treatment. So sometimes it is a single treatment which can restore reproduction in a very simple way. My last example I want to give is a giant panda. Uh, the giant panda is a critical endangered species um, and only the captive breeding program mainly in China but also in associate, associated uh, zoos in the world uh, help to to restore the population and to move the critical endangered status to a more endangered status. And uh, it is not very easy to breed uh, giant pandas in captivity because natural mating is uh, rarely observed. Sometimes it comes to ag uh, aggression between the male and the female and therefore assisted production in form of artificial insemination is the uh, most mostly the way to go. Here you see a giant panda in a computer tomograph that was an, an investigation we performed prior to the artificial insemination to make sure the giant panda is in good health. That's the male giant panda because there were some indication that he had kidney problems. And uh, that's the first uh, CT scan of a giant panda in a, in a full body mode. Uh, and these data help the Chinese colleagues, uh, we're working very close with them uh, a lot to um, set up new health uh, and uh, monitor monitoring systems. The artificial insemination in giant pandas is quite straightforward. You put a very tiny catheter uh, into the cervix and then you inject the semen you have collected prior to this procedure from the male. and uh, that is relatively simple. However, what is not really simple in giant pandas is the situation that they have a dire pause. You don't know when the giant panda will give birth and therefore it is really important that you perform an ultrasound. Uh, this is the ultrasound in Meng Meng when we first saw a heartbeat in her, in her baby, which you can see here. If you look at care uh, carefully, you see a little bit beating gray structure. That is a micro heart of our, uh, one of the twins we have produced with the artificial insemination. The birth took place end of August and the birth is quite uh, impressive in giant pandas. Uh, the investment of the female giant panda into the baby is quite, quite little. She produced a baby which has a size of a guinea pig. It's naked, it has no pigmentation. But then everything uh, comes later because the milk is the green milk in giant pandas is extremely rich on energy and then the babies or well, the baby develop quite quickly. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry that this was a little bit rushed through our procedures, but I hope you got a little bit an insight of our activities and how important it is to preserve our nature. 
And if this is not possible, to use the most advanced technologies to support conservationists all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for the amazing talk. Um, so far, we don't have any questions in YouTube, but we have a little um, time slap there. So maybe we just wait a few seconds if any questions come up. And if not, we can continue with the next speaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Okay. 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 So the next speaker is Andrew. So yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. It's Andrew Tilka. He is Asian Species Officer at Global Wildlife Conservation and a doctoral student with the Department of Ecological Dynamics at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research. His work focuses on the conservation of rare and endemic mammal species in the Annamite Mountains of Vietnam and Laos and the ongoing tropical deformation crisis more broadly. In all aspects of his work, Andrew tries to use ecological research to inform on-the-ground conservation actions. Andrew, we are very excited and look forward to your talk entitled Conservation Projects in Asia. Oh, into the Anamites. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So thank you very much for, for joining this talk. My name is Andrew Tilker, uh, and today I will be taking you into Southeast Asia. And specifically, we're going to be visiting a part of Southeast Asia called the Anamites ecoregion, which is one of the most spectacular parts of the world, in my opinion, for biodiversity. So this is the Anamite eco, the Anamite mountain chain. The Anamite mountain chain straddles the border of Vietnam and Laos, and then arcs down into the southern part of Vietnam. And the Anamites is remarkable because it has one of the highest concentrations of endemic mammal species found anywhere on a continental setting, which include three species of uh, duke, which are, for my money, some of the most spectacular primates in the world, two types of deer, the large antlered munchak and the anamite dark munchak, the anamite striped rabbit, the Ostin civet, and then perhaps most famously of all, the saula, which is a primitive type of wild bovid, which is now one of the rarest large mammals on the planet. Now, all mammals in the Anamites are threatened by unsustainable hunting pressure, which is predominantly accomplished by the setting of indiscriminate wire snares. And hunting is primarily done to fuel the thriving illegal wildlife trade in Vietnam and Laos, which is primarily comprised of bushmeat in restaurants and local markets. Um, and there are 90 million people in Vietnam, some 10 million people in Laos, and you don't have to be a mathematician to understand that this creates a very large demand for wild meat. And we actually see that this has caused what can only be described as a snaring crisis throughout the Anamites ecoregion. In a recent technical report by a, a colleague of mine, Tom Gray, it was estimated that there are probably something like 12 million wire snares in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia alone. So that hints at the magnitude of the snaring problem in the Anamites. Not surprisingly, this snaring crisis has caused many of the endemic species to face an extinction crisis. And that's what I'm really interested in as a conservation scientist, is how we protect these rare endemic uh, species of the Anamites. And so today we're gonna visit two parts of the Anamites. Uh, first, we're gonna go to the central Anamites. And then for the second part of the talk, we're gonna go down south to the southern part of the Anamites. And before I get into this, I wanna quickly mention that I'm fortunate enough to present this work but uh, the work that I'm presenting is really the result of years of extensive collaboration with many different organizations. So I, I wanna highlight that at the beginning of my talk, that none of this would, be, would have been possible without these great collaborate, collaborators working on the ground. So first, we're gonna go to the central Anamites. 
here we are in central Vietnam and southern Laos. And this is work that I did for my PhD project at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research. For this work, we worked in uh, five different areas, three areas in Vietnam, Bac Ma National Park and the Hue and Quang Nam Sawa Nature Reserves. And then across the border, we worked in the eastern part of Zaysap National Protected Area and an unprotected forest complex called the Palay Area. And that's important. So remember that for later. Uh, our primary goals in this work were to understand what species exist in the landscape, where they occur, and why they occur there. And to gather information on mammal species in this region, we used a couple different techniques. We used camera trapping, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but in case you're not, a camera trap is just a camera with a motion sensor that takes a picture of an animal when it walks by. And we also used a fairly new technology called uh, invertebrate-derived DNA, in which we were able to collect jungle leeches from the forest, look at the DNA inside the leeches to see what they fed upon, and by extension, understand what animals are in the forest. And, and this is work that is based on some pioneering research done at, by colleagues at the University of Copenhagen, uh, as you can see in this, this figure here. And I do wanna quickly mention that uh, leech work is, is actually my favorite way to collect information because it requires very little effort. All you have to do is walk into the forest and wait for the leeches to find you. So it's actually a very effective way to gather information as well. So uh, from this work, we were able to gather information on a diverse range of mammals that live in this area. Uh, and this includes 23 mammal species, including three anamide endemics and six threatened species. And we used that information in statistical, statistical models called occupancy models. And I don't want to go into the details of occupancy modeling, but I, I will say that this is a way to account for varying levels of species uh, detection and also to predict species distribution across a landscape. And that's what we did. We used this information with covariates that we hypothesized would impact species occurrence. Uh, and we used these relationships to predict species distribution across these study sites. And this is what we see. We did this for all species in the community, shown by this top figure here, and for the rare and endemic species shown in this bottom figure. And you don't need to get caught up on the details. I just want to show that we have four or five study areas, three areas in Vietnam here and two areas in Laos. Some hot spots really stand out from this work especially in these high elevation areas in, in Bakma, this area on the border of the two reserves, and in this area of the Palais area, which is currently not protected, we see that there appear to be concentrations of these rare endemic species that are important for conservation. If we look at individual species, in this case, this Anamite striped rabbit, the Anamite dark munchak, and the Ocean civet, we see a similar trend. We see that there are a few high elevation areas that appear to be very important for these species with high levels of occupancy, and that the highest predicted occupancies are in the Palais area, which is this area in Laos that's not protected. So you might be wondering, we've done all this fancy science, we've uh, made these nice shiny maps, how do we use this information for conservation? And, and there are a few answers to that. First, we have provided a scientific underpinning for protecting the Ban Palay area if the government decides to make that part of a formal protected area. We've provided evidence that it has high biodiversity value. We also provide areas for targeted snare removal, uh, areas where we expect endemic species to have high levels of occupancy and are worth extra protection measures. 
We've also created a conservation baseline so that we can assess population trends in the future to know if what we're doing is actually causing populations to increase. And we've also provided information for some species specific strategies. And I, I don't have time to go in depth into this, but I do want to quickly mention an interesting case, which is that one of the species we expected to find in this landscape is called the large antlered muntjac, and we actually didn't record it in these study sites, probably because it's extinct in these areas. And uh, in, a, in a strange way, not recording this species during my PhD work really uh, inspired myself and some colleagues to invest more in the protection of this unique animal. So we formed a large antlered muntjac working group under the IUCN deer specialist group to ensure that this uh, animite endemic species does not go extinct in other parts of the animal rights. And we're actively working on conservation projects to try to protect this species. Okay, for the second part of my talk, I would like to take you down south to the southern part of the Annamites, actually the southern part of Vietnam. And we're gonna talk about the silver-backed chevrotain. Now, if you don't know what a chevrotain is, don't worry. Uh, it's not a commonly known species, but picture a roe deer if you're in Europe or a white-tailed deer if you're listening from the US, uh, take away the antlers, add two vampire-like fangs, and shrink it down to the size of a football, and you have a chevrotain. Um, they're pretty cool, kind of quirky little creatures. And the silverback chevrotain is unique because it was actually lost to science for a long time. Uh, the silverback chevrotain was discovered in southern Vietnam in the year 1910, and it was the biologist who found it immediately realized that this was something very special, very unique, and he named this as a new species. Nothing was heard about the species, at least in the scientific community, for about 80 years when another specimen was, was uh, found from a local hunter, and that compromised, comprised the fifth known specimen of the silverback chevrotain to exist. Fast forward 25 years, and still there have been no additional scientifically validated specimens. And some conservation scientists were wondering, does this thing still exist? And so as part of global wildlife conservation's search for lost species campaign with uh, input from Leibniz ICW, we set out to find the silverback chevrotain. Um, and one of the first questions we asked was, well, how are we going to go about doing this? We didn't have much to go on. The silverback chevrotain was recorded from just two areas historically. And so we really struggled initially to decide where we're going to look. And we ended up looking in the southern part of Vietnam, near where the species was first described. Uh, in part because the forest in that part of Vietnam is very unique, it's very dry, and we assumed that maybe this unique species would be found in this very unique habitat type. And to look for the animal, we decided to use interview surveys with local people who know the forest well, and to follow that up with uh, actual on-the-ground camera trapping. So uh, we did this, or I shouldn't say we, the teams in Vietnam did this. Um, they conducted interview surveys with local people across three different provinces in Vietnam, covering six different forest areas. Um, and remarkably, from that work, they talked to people from two different forest areas that claimed, yes, they regularly see a gray-colored chevrotain in the forest. Um, some people reported two different types of chevrotain. Some people said we see a single type of chevrotain and it's gray in coloration. And we got really excited when we heard that because uh, we thought that was pretty good evidence that the silverback chevrotain was still in this part of Vietnam. And the teams opportunistically set three camera traps as part of this survey and made plans to come back later to do more detailed uh, follow-up surveys. And to everyone's surprise, well, at least to my surprise, all three camera traps recorded photos of uh, chevrotain that 
will have morphological features consistent with silverback chevrotain. So you can see that these chevrotain have a reddish uh, buff colored front quarters and the back two thirds are gray colored. It, it looks like somebody held this chevrotain in a bucket of, of gray paint and just kind of dipped it two thirds of the way down. And this represents the first scientifically confirmed evidence that the, that the silverback chevrotain still exists and the first photographs of the species that have ever been taken in the wild. Um, we decided to follow up on this exciting scientific discovery with additional surveys and some museum specimen verification. So we conducted additional camera trapping in the area, and we also looked at uh, the one, one of the museum specimens in detail to compare very specific morphological characteristics. And from that work, it left us with little doubt that, yes, in fact, this is the silverback chevrotain, and it is still existing in the remote forests of southern Vietnam. So uh, you might be wondering, what are the next steps? Can we check this off and simply go to the next lost species? And the answer is no, this, the work is just beginning. Um, so there are a couple of things we're gonna do to try to protect the species. Uh, first, we are trying to protect the species where it exists, where we've confirmed it. Um, we've already secured a little bit of funding and we've, we've identified some key areas in the protected area that we want to prioritize for snare removal. Um, this work has been delayed due to COVID as has virtually everything else. Um, so that is still a work in progress. Uh, however, this is still a short-term solution. Given the magnitude of snaring in these areas, it's important to highlight that it's going to take a lot of work to actually remove snares from these forests, from that forest. So it's something to keep in mind. It's a long road ahead. The second thing we need to do, and perhaps more important in my opinion, is to find out more information about the silverback chevrotain. We, we need to know where does it occur in, in southern Vietnam? How many populations are there? What are the primary threats to these populations, which could be different in different areas? Uh, we expect forest loss and degradation are going to be threats, and we know that uh, indiscriminate snaring is going to be a major threat to the species. So really getting a hold of, of, of how many animals are out there and what are the major threats is very important to laying out a, cons a strategic conservation plan to protect it. Um, we have made some progress on this, working with colleagues from Global Wildlife Conservation, the Leibniz IZW, uh, Green Viet, and Southern Institute of Ecology. We've laid out a strong uh, uh, roadmap for areas that we want to survey in Southern Vietnam. So we have this detailed plan made. And the teams have actually already looked in one of the priority areas. And from that initial very preliminary work, they were uh, able to confirm a second population of silverback chevrotain. I, I'm not even sure this is public news yet, so it, it's it's a bit hot off the press. Um, but they have confirmed a second population of silverback chevrotain in a different part of Vietnam that is not currently a protected area. Now, unfortunately, with that work, they're also starting to piece together some of the major threats to the species, and it's become very apparent that the, the silverback chevrotain is being snared as part of the ongoing indiscriminate snaring crisis in Vietnam. This is an animal that was snared and caught alive, actually brought back alive uh, from a local hunter. Um, unfortunately, it died shortly after this video was taken, but it shows that yes, this animal, like all animals in the forest of Vietnam, is being snared and there's no question that it's causing declines in its population. The question is just how much. But I want to close my talk with on a note of optimism. Um, I'm very hopeful about the Silverback Shepherdin project. I'm very excited to see where it goes. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, is the great group of collaborators that are working on it. Uh, and in, in addition to colleagues at Global Wildlife Conservation and the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research, uh, we're working with a couple of organizations in Vietnam, including Green Viet and the Southern Institute of Ecology, and it would be hard to find a more passionate, dedicated group of conservation scientists. They're really fantastic, and they're driving this work forward. So uh, because they're so great, I think there's, we, there's a lot we can do. And the second is that 
there are still big patches of forest in southern Vietnam that have really never been surveyed. So I'm, I'm very encouraged that we will find additional populations of silverback chevrotain and that we can protect them as long as we can get the funding to do that. And so finally, I want to thank all of these uh, supporters for all of their help. Um, without their support, we, I, we couldn't have done any of this work. And if there's time, I'm happy to take a, a couple questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was very interesting. Um, so, yeah, we have a few questions for you. Um, the first one is from Jan. He's asking, how does it feel to you personally to discover and investigate new species at the same time as they maybe go extinct? What is your personal motivation? You know, it's it's a bittersweet emotion. Um, my personal motivation is just that I, I think there's a, a moral imperative to try to protect these critically endangered species so that they're here for generations to come, for my children and grandchildren. Um, so it's 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 something that it's a difficult line of work to be in, but it's also something that I feel very passionate about, and my my colleagues and I are very driven to change. And I will say that there are enough success stories to stay optimistic, and that also helps keep you going. Many thanks. And Sarah is asking, can you tell us a bit more about this leeches derived DNA? How does it work? What were big surprises? And did you also find lost species like with the camera traps? <laughs> Good question. So uh, in short, there, there's a, a kind of a, an entire field of invertebrate derived DNA where, where scientists have taken blood sucking insects or invertebrates like leeches and looked at the blood inside these, uh, these invertebrates to see what they fed on. And the, the concept is actually very simple. Look, get a leech, get a mosquito, get a, a horsefly, look at the blood inside it, run DNA, do DNA barcoding, and figure out what mammal or other species that blood belongs to. So that's the basic principle. Um, in reality, obviously, it's very technical and very complex and not quite that straightforward, but that's the, but the, that's the basic idea. Um, and we haven't discovered anything unusual yet. No lost species in, in the leeches that we used for our project. Um, but I think there's room for using this technique, especially to search for very rare species in other tropical rainforests. I, th I think there's a lot of scope for using this in the future. OK, thank you. And another question from Huang. Um, hi, Mr. Andrew. You may be concerned about poaching of this species in Vietnam, so we need to limit disclosure of any relevant information about it, right? Yes, that's a good point. Um, that's a very good point. And actually, we were very careful in the publication that resulted from this work to not disclose the area where we we quote unquote rediscovered the first population. So that isn't in the publication. It's not in the press release. Uh, it's not anywhere in the public domain as far as I know. Um, and we're also very careful not to name exactly where we found this other population. It's a, it's, it's a tricky subject because we, we want to gather support for the animal and its conservation, and that entails sharing information with the public. But I absolutely agree that we have to be very careful about naming exact locations because we don't want that to bring increased poaching pressure uh, on those populations. So it's a tight it's a tight rope, and we're very careful not to name exact locations in any of our publications or, or media. Um, he also adds, um, I think now that to sustainably preserve any important animal populations. We need the participation of communities, especially the local people living around the areas where animals are existent. And um, this means that information needs to be more widely disclosed, except in the case of only a few remaining individuals. What do you think about this? We'll completely agree that we need the support of local communities. Uh, I mean, it's, it's difficult to make any conservation strides on the ground without the support of local communities. So um, absolutely agree that 
this is key to the success of any conservation projects in Vietnam or you know elsewhere for that matter. Um, and I do think there is room for increased public engagement so that the public at large, including communities living in and around these forest areas, understand uh, the wider context and why it's important to protect these aspects of biodiversity. Um, but again, it, I also realize it's important not to provide exact information that could encourage poachers to uh, further target some highly vulnerable populations. So it, I think it's very context dependent is, is, a short, is the short answer. But yes, in general, we absolutely need to involve local communities as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And we have another question from Jenny. Um, she's saying really cool talk. When you are relying on information from interviews with local people, is there ever any chance of a conflict of interest if they hunt the animals? Uh, conflict of interest, meaning maybe these people already hunt the animals and we want and we go to them for information. Uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, that is also a tricky situation. Um, Hunting is still very widespread in, in Vietnam and in other parts of the tropics. Uh, and often the hunters are the ones who have the most current or the most reliable information about these rare species because they are the individuals that are spending time in the forest. And so that can be a conflict of interest of sorts. And so there is an interesting, I guess you could say, moral question about whether or not you talk to these people or you don't. Um, in, in the work that my colleagues and I have done, we've always, we have approached hunters to get information on these species, but have always been careful not to condone hunting behavior. Um, so it, it is an issue. Um, what we found in Vietnam is that many times there are people who are hunting, but often don't talk about it. And so it isn't something that comes up and it's sometimes hard to know who's hunting and who's not. So it is a complex topic. Um, I think I think we could we could have another talk on that entirely, but <laughs> probably for next 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 year. Yeah, and maybe one last question for you um, from Zoo Rocklove. I'll be grateful for more information about other species found in forests in Vietnam. If that's not too broad for this situation. No? Sure. Oh wow! How many hours do you have? Um, <laughs> so. So there, the short answer is that, as I, I hope was was clear in the beginning of the talk, there are a suite of species found only in the Annamites, uh, pre predominantly in Vietnam, and many of them are are going are on the verge of extinction or or their populations are declining. So there are a number of mammals that really need urgent conservation attention. I happen to talk about you know silverback chevrotain and mention rabbit and and large antlered muntjac, but there are really a suite of species that need urgent conservation attention that are only found in this part of the world. Um, so, so one benefit of working on, in this area is that often by protecting a high biodiversity site, uh, you're able to implement conservation actions in an area where multiple species coexist. So I kind of a side thought that that uh, that is a strategy that my colleagues and I are pursuing is to, is to ver be very strategic in the areas where we focus our conservation attentions to try to protect as many of these vulnerable animite endemic mammal species as possible. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, we actually have one more question for Thomas. Thomas, are you still here? Uh, I don't know. Maybe we keep this question for the next round. Maybe I so can then, who? Stephen. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I read it out. Um, how long would it take to create, with the current techniques, a viable population of northern white rhinos, which reproduces on its own if we rule out poaching? Thirty years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the 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 fact that the northern white rhino can't reproduce by itself anymore because we have only two uh, infertile females left means we have to apply these uh, quite advanced assisted reproduction mm -hmm. techniques. And uh, our goal, our 
short-term goal is to have a calf of the northern white rhino on the ground in two, two and a half years. And to have a viable genetic solid population, which can be reintroduced, we uh, have the plan to uh, achieve this goal in about two decades. However, the calculation, uh, internal calculation says that we need about 1 million US dollar per calf. So right now we don't have the resources for that, uh, but we are all quite optimistic as uh, otherwise we would not uh, work on this uh, mission. And we, we hope with the help of a new scientist, uh, growing up scientist, that we will achieve this ambitious goal. Thank you. And there's another addition, additional question um, of about how many individuals would we need germ cells to create such a population with enough genetic diversity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we are quite in a fortunate pos position that we have 12 unrelated individuals in liquid nitrogen and their genetic uh, diversity represents actually more genetic diversity than the entire population of the southern red rhino. How can that be? Um, you have to know that the, at the beginning of the 20th century, the, northern, uh, the southern red rhino was nearly extinct and survived in a very small population in the province of Natal in Omphalosi. And from there, it slowly uh, reproduced natural wise in this case, and uh, build up the population, which is now 25,000 individuals. And we uh, screened this uh, population for their genetic diversity. And actually what we have in our liquid nitrogen tanks from the northern white rhino represents actually more gene diversity than in the entire population of the 25,000 individuals. So actually this biological material represents a very viable source to achieve the goal we have. However, we need to develop technologies which are not available right now, include, including stem cell technology. We call it in vitro gametogenesis, uh, which means you, you breed out of a skin cell with a way of using an induced pluripotent stem cell. Uh, you make sperm and eggs in a Petri dish. That is very ambitious, was only shown in mouse models so far. But we think uh, that is a fair chance to achieve our goal. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and one last question for Andrew that just came in. Um, are there any non-mammal species identified in your leeches? Uh, whew, that's a, a, probably a question that would be best left to the, the technical lab guys. But um, in short, yes, uh, I know that we used a mammal specific primer. And so we specifically kind of targeted mammals only. But I think we did get a few birds in our in our species. And I know in our, our leeches and a few other uh, organizations doing this similar type of work have found uh, snakes, frogs, lizards, other things. Um, leeches seem to feed on just about anything that will move, at least in, in Vietnam. So um, yeah, it's possible to get information on other vertebrates as well. Cool, thank you. Okay, then we can move on to the next uh, talk, which is from Stephen Seed. Yeah, I'm happy to introduce Stephen Seed, our next speaker. He's head of public relations, science communication, international conference and fundraising at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research. After studying political economics, psychology, ethnology, and sociology, Stephen graduated in sociology. After six years having his own full service advertising agency, he started his career in strategic public relations, political communication, and science communication at the Leibniz ICW. He is also responsible for organizing national and international congresses and events. And as head of fundraising, he develops alternative fundraising strategies. Stephen received several communication awards and is consultant for press, media, and stake stakeholder communication. Stephen, we are very much looking forward to your talk, and the title is Successful Science Communication at the Leibniz ICW, a practical guide or behind the scenes. Thank you. Hey, can, can you see my talk? 
No, not yet. Not yet. Why not? I um, just started again. You need to click on the uh, Freigeben button or share, whatever it is. Yeah, I, did, I did share. Okay, then the PowerPoint. Yeah, now yes. it's getting better. Okay, hi everybody. So nice to have you here. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about strategic communication at the Leibniz ISW. And um, altogether, I think you heard the talk of our director, but uh, in short, what are we doing as scientific institution? Uh, so our task is interdisciplinary research and we try to develop the scientific basis for novel approaches to wildlife conservation. Um, in doing so, of course, we have a vision and a mission. So our main mission is to contribute to an understanding of the response of wildlife to environmental change. And based on this, we uh, design appropriate science-based uh, interventions for conservation purposes. Um, how do we do this? We have a large team. Um, we have six departments, uh, wildlife diseases, evolutionary genetics, evolutionary ecology, reproduction biology, reproduction management, and ecological dynamics. And um, what we do if we have a, a research project, we try to join as uh, much expertise as possible. Uh, and this is why we have a lot of um, long-term, but also uh, some so short-term research, um, research uh, topics and research doing. And the question is how to best communicate uh, the results of research. And uh, there's a wide landscape of media. And the main question is how can you reach out? Um, so in the first place, of course, you can do trial and error, but this is not leading uh, to good success. So the first question you have to ask yourself is what is strategy? What is strategy? What is strategic communication? So a strategy is, in, is a general plan to achieve long-term or overall goals under conditions of uncertainty. As I said, it's not trial and error in the first place. It, it can be a strategy to use trial and error and learn from this. But uh, uh, when it comes to the key of strategy, it is planning. Planning, you have to have a plan, then the outcome will be better. So in principle, we have on the one hand basic principles, and on the other hand, we have uh, things which are influenced by the basics. So if you have a research institution, then you have different things such as a mission statement, you have uh, all over strategy, um, you have a manage management strategy, you have a strategy for knowledge transfer, but uh, in general, uh, there are um, directions and um, connections uh, you can follow. Uh, in, in the, on the one hand, as I said, you have the basics, and from there derived, we have uh, different um, consequences. And based on based on this, um, I made a chart. You can see the structure um, of our uh, goal system. So uh, in here in the middle, you see the overall strategy of the institute. Uh, pointed out in its uh, mission and vision and goals. So this is a really, really key thing. Uh, if you, once you set the goals, then uh, from this, it depends for the other areas, you have goals which are nearly related. So if you have the overall strategy, uh, then from this derives the strategy for management, uh, for uh, for science uh, and for our part, we are talking about is it's the knowledge exchange strategies. Um, so if once we know the overall strategy, we can develop strategies for the knowledge exchange. And if we have the strategies, we can go a step further and do the measures. So we are using measures uh, to 
uh, communicate and then in the end if we do so um, it is very important that uh, we have some kind of uh, impact monitoring and then it's 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 a circle that uh, the information we gain from the monitoring we will uh, then go back uh, to the uh, and look whether the strategy is still okay and what what we want to reach out uh, in general um, this is uh, a short bit uh, of our uh, goal system of the Leibniz ISW. So we have uh, the three pillars, it's research, it's applications, and it's organization and governance. And so briefly, briefly spoken is really, it is some kind of um, linear work we're doing. We have different documents and as you see, we um, we have we list all the goals we have, and within the goals we try to explain um, what is what what do we understand what kind of goal it is, and then we try to find indicators how to measure uh, the goal. Uh, so this is on the on on the institute's level, and uh, the, the second step would be uh, the uh, opera. Operationalisierung, operationalization, yeah, it's a difficult word, <laughs> of the Leibniz ISW strategy. So based on, on the large goals we have, we can go into detail. It is something like um, um, these are the large goals and then we try uh, to, uh, to have the questions or answer the questions, what must be uh, done to reach this goal and uh, based on this what what uh, if we have our capacities what what additional things we need uh, to do to reach our aims and uh, if we once we defined the aims on the next level um, we can define the single task we have to do and we have optional tasks to do and based on this, we can allocate resources. We can say, okay, who is uh, responsible uh, for, for fulfilling this task? So um, in this column, uh, we dedicate uh, our different uh, tasks then to uh, units. So for instance, here we have for the press or for the, the management. And if, if you do this for a very uh, for all the aims and goals you have in the institution and you have a, it's a really huge document and uh, from this is deriving a structure you can work with. So we have, we have science management, we have knowledge and technology transfer, we have PR and science communication, uh, services for science and fundraising. So this, uh, on, and then we have the administration. So this is the, um, ideal situation um, how you define different tasks and then within the unit you can work and of course uh, this is this is a plan we made uh, uh, starting by 2018 uh, now we have 2020 but so far we did not uh, achieve to have a lot of staff members uh, um, having yeah, just w working on on those issues. So th the more staff members you have, the the more in detail you can allocate the resources. But uh, but our plan is in, in future to to get all those different um, areas. Uh, uh, yeah, that that we can uh, fulfill it with with staff members, and then we can work uh, on transforming and uh, yeah, being capable to have this outreach. So um, I just give you an example. As we heard from Thomas, uh, we have the biorescue research project. And uh, based on this, I show you how we adjust and how we apply those strategies. Uh, so in the first place, we have a large consortium. These are the consortium um, members, and these are supporters and consortium members. And uh, here you can see some of them, the project nearly started in 2015, and we have different members uh, representing different international 
organizations. So what if it comes to the strategy, uh, we, we form a, a linear um, weight from goals of uh, to measures and back. So on the top, we have the ISW overall goals. Uh, from here derived, we have the project goals. Then we defined outreach goals. We defined target groups and outreach measures. And on the end, uh, if we have the, um, the outreach, then we can evaluate whether it was successful or not. And then we can adjust the whole process. So when it comes to the biorescue project goals, um, we, we had a kickoff meeting in 2015 and we wanted to have in 2016 a white paper publication uh, and another one, another publication uh, in 2018. And uh, from 15, 2015 to 2019, it was <laughs> uh, a major aim to, to get a main sponsor or a main funder. And we succeeded in May 2019. And as you can see, uh, if if we go to the very right, we can see our plan is uh, that we have uh, the first pregnancy next year, and uh, some years later we will have uh, gametes from the stem cells technology. So these this is uh, these are project goals of the biorescue project. So now it comes to our outreach goals. Um, we try to raise awareness for the new technologies we are using. Uh, we try to stimulate so the, the discourse from society when it comes to ethical questions, because every time you're uh, applying new technologies, it is very important to discuss with uh, different stakeholders in society um, what are the consequences. We try to, for to foster the use of insights from the research uh, and inform politics, economics, and civil society. We promote publicity uh, for additional support of the project. We strengthen the individual reputation of the project and the special uh, the dedicated researchers. Uh, we try to establish uh, networks, <coughs> sorry, uh, between uh, scientists, stakeholders, and civil society. We communicate the capabilities of German high-tech research. Uh, we support international communication within the consortium. And of course, we try to get uh, further fundraising. These are our research goals, uh, outreach goals. Um, and this leads into measures. So we have a list, a huge list of measures, such as uh, informing the general public by press releases, um, then having special publication uh, issues and um, formats such as workshops. We use websites, social media communication, and the very keystone in this project was uh, film and photography. So we did, uh, um, we had some really famous uh, supporters such as Amy Vitale. She's a National Geographic ambassador photographer. We are working with large broadcasting companies such as BBC uh, together. And we try to support long-term documentaries. Um, of course, we also have some public events. Um, when it comes uh, to setting these measures, into um, action. Uh, we did it for 2019 and 2020. You can see here's a list of international uh, press conferences we held, uh, accompanying the different steps within the research project. And based on this, uh, we decided to use uh, uh, for the storytelling key elements of uh, film and uh, photos to have really a good uh, uh, sense of um, a basis for storytelling. Uh, we used a lot of different channels of social, social media and um, this uh, leads into a very good uh, material. 
and uh, I, I put this together some uh, sequence uh, of those materials. So uh, when we have a trip uh, uh, to Kenya, for instance, uh, um, to have an ovum pickup on the rhinos, uh, we document the whole process. And it starts with uh, the check-in in Berlin, and um, then you can you can see it, it's the travel to Kenya, and we try to document uh, every single step. Then it is uh, we are uh, on the site in Kenya, having a first uh, checkup of the animals. Then we are looking uh, how are the uh, different locations are looking, where we can place our cameras, uh, and uh, we are planning the, the setup for the media work. Um, then we accompany uh, the whole process uh, of, of the research, um, and we try always to have high uh, quality uh, photo and film material. And you can see uh, this the transport of the oocytes to the helicopter, then the airport, then it comes to the lab work in Italy. So we really try to document every single step. And these are uh, the embryos uh, we succeeded to produce. And um, then it comes, if we have all those pictures, it comes uh, to the uh, behind the scenes work. Uh, so for instance, this, um, uh, this uh, field trip we did uh, uh, within, we had a press conference next day, and here you can see a scene. It is uh, very early in the morning. Uh, so we took all the, the, the footage material and we sit together with a filmmaker who's on the uh, top right. And um, we prepared everything uh, for the media and uh, do, did all the uh, cutting of the material. And uh, I try to show you some bits of what we produce. These are the last two north and white rhinos left in the world, Najin and Fatu. Without a male, there is no way for them to breed. So you can see this is a, a high resolution pictures. Working to invent a new method. We can use it for storytelling in different formats. And we did so. Uh, we used the material for different formats. This is, for instance, uh, uh, a story about uh, the influence of COVID. In my career as a scientist, I often have to deal with the unknown. However, the COVID-19 crisis, it's a huge unknown. And it caused a lot so of... So the moving picture is a very important element for us. They are normally causing animal-borne diseases. We find these diseases in cats, in pigs, in birds. And the very interesting thing is uh, that we even sold the material to different broadcasters. And we are uh, really um, happy common in, in that different uh, broadcasters uh, took the material and they start working with the material. So this was a, a contribution with David Attenborough from the BBC. And when we jump to the middle, you can see the same Using in vitro uh, fertilization techniques, we produce the will take eggs from the last two females and attempt to fertilize them with frozen sperm collected from two northern white rhino males before their deaths. So we produced once material and uh, we distributed it really widely and so um, when it comes to the effect of uh, having the, the goals on the top and then to have a strategy a research strategy and uh, an outreach strategy then it comes to measurements and uh, w finally you get uh, the result of communication and for instance, uh, here we listed some of the bits we gained. So in 2019, we had more than 5,500 uh, media clippings uh, worldwide. 
and uh, single videos for instance this bbc video i showed you uh, has a really a large number of uh, viewers it was uh, now it's nearly seven million clicks um here you can see that uh, we reached uh, more than 1.6 billion uh, people on the whole planet in on, on the whole world distributed and this was also in in a lot of prime time media uh so in the end it turned out uh Excuse, sorry your time expired. ah my time uh then then i i i just want to mention uh, two other things uh, uh one is the the impact uh we got uh, a letter from girls uh and they're starting uh based on our communication their own communication and started to collect money for for our project uh other formats we did was auctions so we where we had a painting we went for auction and uh so in the end uh, to it is very important to have a strategic communication which is based uh, on a plans of goals and uh, so the uh, yeah in, in the end we could show that the outcome uh, is is very very interesting if you use a wide range of uh, combination of tools um and the next uh, the thing is what what comes next and our next project will be something uh, uh with knowledge exchange and it's called knowledge exchange meets crowdfunding and there we try to use the the crowdfunding system uh to establish uh uh communication work so uh, knowledge transfer and this is the last thing i show you so if we go on on this then uh this is a crowdfunding funding page and within the page we have different campaigns and we're using then the campaigns to combine to combine uh crowdfunding then with information so we we try to inform people what's going on and uh, we try to get their involved so we ask for comments and and try to get uh, in contact with with different donors so this was nothing yes thank you very much Stephen, for the slide, yeah yeah are you finished okay <laughs> thank you great talk um we have one question from zoo rockoff who asks just one short question um five million clicks or views uh this this were uh, five million views okay thanks so this is really a lot for, and and I, we have to admit that um when david edinburgh uh, put this video online then it uh, within the first hours it, it started to have really a high number of views so it uh, it's really went viral great um and sarah is asking um thank you can you tell us something about the alternative fundraising strategies besides crowdfunding the alternative strategies so one one strategy is of course uh, to um uh, to use uh, visual communication to reach out for sponsors so it is uh, uh, within within the uh, messages you you're broadcasting uh, you can uh, you can interview uh, the researchers and ask them what what is needed and uh, they can state uh, that uh, there are still bits which are not financed and so you can use communication uh, to address uh, the need of further uh, fundraising and this was uh, within our project it was successful we we got some donors um, by uh, using the channel of communication to very openly uh, talk about uh, the problem and the race against time. So uh, there are possibilities to to get uh, funding, further funding by using communication. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, so far, no other questions regarding the talk. But we have a general question from David, who's asking if there are any current um, opportunities for master's students to conduct a master's thesis at the ISW. Does well, anybody uh, know of anything? <laughs> Well, it's uh, at any time. So he, he just uh, can send an email uh, to our human resources um, uh, section and then they will provide it in the house and ask whether or not uh, there are open positions. Okay, thank you. I will also... Um... We are happy to receive uh, applications. Sure. I will insert the, the link to our um, open open staff opportunities into the YouTube chat. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I think we can move on to the next speaker, which is Jan Zwilling. Yes, and Jan Zwilling is a science communicator at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research. And he studied geography at Humboldt University of Berlin and worked in science communication throughout his entire career for various scientific organizations. Since 2018, he helps spreading the word about the research for conservation at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research. Combining his passion for nature photography and science communication, he strives to tell visual stories about scientific advances, advances <coughs> that significantly help nature conservation. He is a member of the German Society, of, Society for Nature Photography and the Rhino and Forest Fund. And Jan will tell us something on the visual storytelling for research and conservation. Thank you, Jan. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Sarah, for the nice introduction. Um, as you already mentioned, uh, my name is Jan Zwilling, and I'm working for science communication at the Leibniz ISW together with Stephen, whom you've heard before. Um, furthermore, I might add that I'm not a biologist or veterinarian by training, but a geographer and political scientist which I think tremendously helps to um, tackle this translation uh, issue that you're facing in communication. Um, additionally, I'm also a passionate nature photographer using uh, visual media as a toolbox to communicate about nature, science and conservation. And my talk is called Visual Storytelling for Research and Conservation. So I think um, let's jump right in. I want to start uh, at the very root roots and ask, uh, what is conservation anyway? Uh, in my opinion, it denominates the protection, preservation and restoration of nature in all its facets, habitats, species, processes and services. But if we say protection, then we have to ask protection from what? Surely not from itself, because nature has proven to get along very well on its own for millions of years. So there must be something outside of nature, or at least a part enough to the rest within nature, that is needed to be protected from. And surprise, surprise, it's us humans. Conservation, by and large, is a very process not embedded in nature, but connected to us humans. And it's, it is uh, recognizing our impact, uh, the harm we do to the diversity and the resilience of nature, and the decision to, rule, uh, to reduce this impact. I think it's pretty obvious that Conservation is essentially a social and a political process. And although conservation action is based on scientific advancement, for example, in biology and related disciplines, and on successfully implementing solutions for real world problems, it needs societal discourse to enable political decisions. On various scales, uh, we have to do conservation, and that means communication, in my opinion. It is information disseminated, it is messages spread, it's discussions sparked and mindset. And one powerful tool to com communicate is uh, through visuals. And I will take you on a quick ride from past to present to show you some examples of how visual storytelling can be a crucial part of conservation action. The first image I want to show is a painting by Thomas Cole. It was created in 1836. And Thomas Cole was a member of the Hudson River School on the US East Coast. Painters there were on the one hand inspired by European Romantic paintings on the one hand, and for example, by Caspar David Friedrich, and on the other hand, uh, part of an exploration movement to the US West. What can we see in this painting about nature and human relation to nature? I think we can see a separation between civilized and wild. 
which was very typical for medieval and late medieval societies. Nature on the left was dangerous, dark, or the tamed agricultural landscape on the right by our garden Eden. I think this speaks volumes of the separation of humans from the natural world and also strikes a chord with a very conquering view of wilderness. This like dichotomic uh, view of uh, wilderness versus tamed non-wild world, I think is very typical for the medieval view of uh, nature. Uh, if you recall fairy tales, for example, where a little red riding hood went into the very dangerous forest. But the Romantic period also started a new movement, a new way of seeing the natural world. Originating in the fascination of the divine in nature and God's creation, painters began to portray wilderness as places of spirituality, of wonder, of admiration. And here's another example, also from the Hudson River School, um, from painter Albert Bierstadt. He created these paintings in the 1860s and 70s, and he accompanied many explorations to the Rocky Mountains of Sierra Nevada and painted like monumental scenes, such as this one here from the Sierra Nevada in California. Nature here is no longer a place of danger and, and threat, but it's a place for being stunned, moved, and oppressed, and maybe protected already. But maybe only, but the, for this purpose, these paintings were clearly too exaggerated. Bierstadt combined several locations into one scene, elevated the weather and the light clearly not uh, to become a realistic scene. But seven years before Bierstadt painted this monumental piece, another visual artist visited the Sierra Nevada mountains in California and created work with much more realism. This uh, Carlton Watkins, who came to San Francisco during the 1849 gold rush, and as many in this movement too, looked for a different occupation after the rush was over. He opened a photographic studio and became very, very skillful with his new techniques. In 1861, he mounted a huge self-built wooden camera on a buckboard and took a caravan with 12 mules into the Sierra Nevada mountains. <clears throat> he was among the very first to photograph there and the photographs were a sensation. Uh, Senator John Connors of California was very impressed by these photographs and widely distributed them in Washington. And he also introduced a bill to protect the Yosemite Valley, which is exactly what you see in this uh, photograph created in 1965, actually. And uh, the bill was uh, signed by both houses of the United States uh, government and signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1865 creating the, what is called Yosemite Grant. And the Yosemite Grant was the first time that a federal government set aside land for preservation of nature and for the recreation of visitors, although the land was ceded to California as a state park. Eight years later, Thomas uh, already mentioned it in this, his talk, the Yellowstone National Park was created. As of today, we have more than 3,300 uh, 3, national parks all over the world with a combined area of 52 million square kilometers. So what we see here on the left side in the photograph is uh, the birth of one of like, our most powerful conservation ideas, the national park idea. And it was helped significantly by a truly pioneering set of photos created more than 160 years ago. And if you look at what this story, uh, this photo has to tell, I think it's very simple. It's just, look at this, isn't this wonderful? Should we not protect it to stay like this forever? And this has uh, become a fundamental narrative of conservation. Uh, let's fast forward a hundred years to this photograph. A lot has changed, of course, in these 100 years. World population, population grew significantly, industrialization and urbanization radically, changed our societies and the natural world. And while conservation as a goal and a process evolved, I think the separation of humans from the natural world deepened further. Uh, what was unique for the period after the Second World War was uh, it enabled a change of perspective for global societies. International air traffic brought the world so close to us that we were ready to adopt global perspectives, also for conservation. So this very photo you're seeing right now came at the exactly right time. It was taken by astronauts on board of uh, Apollo 8 mission in 1968 
and is one of the first images of planet Earth seen from space. It had an enormous impact on the global conservation movement in the 1970s and 1980s because it told a different story than the photos from the wild places you've seen before. It said, well, look, the Earth is not spectacular and, and wonderful only, but it's also small and vulnerable. The resources are not endless. This is all we have. We better take good care of it. And there was really a very powerful story that was initiated and transported through this photo. So let's jump another 50 years in time to 2018. This photograph may ring a bell to those uh, of you who have already listened to Thomas Hiddelman's talk or to Stephen Seed's uh, talk about the Northern Red Rhino Rescue Probe. It shows the very last moment of comforting the last male northern white rhino on our planet in 2018. It was taken by National Geographic photographer Amy Vitale, and it was uh, and became immensely popular and immensely famous. It was recently voted as the number one National Geographic photo of the decade from 1910 to 1918, uh, 2010 to 2018, sorry. And and I think the power of this photo is that it does not show only the last moments of an animal and a moment of comfort with his keeper. It shows so much more. Uh, Amy Vitale would put it this way. It shows the very worst and the very best in humanity as far as our relation to the natural world is concerned. It is a testament to the accelerating biodiversity loss, the mass extinction that we are causing on a planet, but it's also the portrait of people extremely dedicated to these animals. It's uh, both heart wrenching and hopeful at the same time. And I think it demonstrates well the power of photograph in the best possible way. But hope, as you have already heard, does not only come from dedicated caretakers such as Jojo here, but also from science. In fact, we at the ICW are closely interconnected with the fate of the Northern White Rhino as we lead the scientific rescue mission. The goal is to advance artificial reproduction technologies far enough to save these wonderful animals, even in the light of their entire population being only two females. Here are a few photos that I would show our team on this mission. Advancing technologies is a, is a good keyword. What we do here at Leibniz ICW is research on many levels of biology and veterinary medicine, which includes meticulous lab work, but also sitting in the car in the field and observing behavior. And a pivotal cornerstone of our research from conservation is to make full use of technology that enables us to keep up with the pace of global environmental change and opens new horizons for science. These two images perfectly uh, are, are perfect examples for this. On the left, we have a computer model 3D rendering of a leopard based on a com computer tomography. And we at the ICW have one of the most powerful computer tomographs for wildlife. And it's a great tool both for scientific insights and for creating imagery for communication purposes. This leopard image uh, won a third prize at a science image competition in Germany in 2010. And on the right side, you see a 3D ultrasound image of an elephant fetus that Thomas Hildebrandt helped creating for a National Geographic film called in the womb back in 2009, I think. Both images push the boundaries of scientific learning processes, but also for societal understanding of biological processes. They greatly foster the very processes of discourse, of broadening horizons, of mindsetting, and eventually of doing conservation work. So what is missing? Yes, of course, uh, moving images is missing. Films and video clips have proven to have equal, if not even more, impact than still photographies or, or paintings. What they add to static visual media is a flowing narrative, an integration of other media, such as voices or music, and of course, the possibility to cross over artistic boundaries. For the conclusion of my talk, I want to show you a short clip that the organization TED has created for the Northern Red Rhine Rescue Mission. It lasts five minutes and uh, it shows very well how a visual approach can greatly underpin an important uh, message for conservation. Um, I think we have enough time to come back after watching this uh, for some final words, but now enjoy this clip. In the savannas of Kenya, two female northern white rhinos, Nayan and Fatu, munch contentedly on the grass. At the time of this 
this video's publication, these are the last two known northern white rhinos left on Earth. Their species is functionally extinct. Without a male, Nayan and Fatu can't reproduce. And yet, there's still hope to revive the northern white rhino. How can that be? The story starts about 50 years ago, when poachers began illegally hunting thousands of rhinos across Africa for their horn. This, combined with civil wars in their territory, decimated northern white rhino populations. Concerned conservationists began trying to free them in captivity in the 1970s, collecting and storing semen from males. Only four rhinos were ultimately born through the ambitious breeding program. Nayan and her daughter Fatu were the last two. In 2014, conservationists discovered that neither can have a cat. Though Nayan gave birth to Fatu, she now has weak hind legs, which could harm her health if she became pregnant again. Fatu, meanwhile, has a degenerated uterine lining. Then, the last northern white rhino male of the species, Sudan, died in 2018. But there was one glimmer of hope, artificial reproduction. With no living males and no females able to carry a pregnancy, this is a complicated and process to say the least. Though scientists had stored semen, they would have to collect the egg, a complex procedure that requires a female to be sedated for up to two hours. Then they create a viable embryo in the lab, something that had never been done before and no one knew how to do. Even that was just the beginning. A surrogate mother of another rhino species would have to carry the embryo to term. Females of a closely related species, the southern white rhino, became both the key to developing a rhino embryo in a lab and the leading candidate for surrogate mothers. Northern and southern white rhino diverged about a million years ago into separate, though still closely related species. They inhabit different regions and have slightly different physical traits. In a fortunate coincidence, several female southern white rhinos needed treatment for their own reproductive problems, and researchers could collect eggs as part of that treatment. In Devour Kralove Zoo, in October 2015, experts of IZW Berlin began collecting eggs from southern white rhino and sending them to Avantia, an animal reproduction laboratory in Italy. There, scientists developed and perfected a technique to create a viable embryo. Once they mastered the technique, researchers extracted Nayan and Fatu's eggs on August 22, 2019, and flew them to Italy. Three days later, they fertilized the eggs with sperm from a northern white rhino male. After another week, two of the eggs made it to the stage of development, when the embryo can be frozen and preserved for the future. Another collection in December 2019 produced one more embryo. As of early 2020, the plan is to collect Nayan and Fatu's eggs three times a year if they're healthy. In the meantime, researchers are looking for promising southern white rhino surrogate mothers, ideally who carried a pregnancy to term before. The surrogacy plan is somewhat of a leap of faith. Southern and northern white rhinos have interbred both during the last glacial period and more recently in 1977. So researchers are optimistic a southern white rhino would be able to carry a northern white rhino to term. Also, the two species' pregnancies are the same length. Still, transferring an embryo to a rhino is tricky because of the shape of the cervix. The ultimate goal, which will take decades, is to establish a breeding population of northern white rhinos in their original range. Studies suggest that we have samples from enough individuals to recreate a population with the genetic diversity the species had a century ago. Though the specifics of this effort are unique, as more species face critical endangerment or functional extinction, it's also an arena for big questions. Do we have a responsibility to try to bring species back from the brink, especially when human action brought them there in the first place? Are there limits to effort we should extend on saving animals threat? How are conservationists and communities helping endangered species recover? See how some regions are working to repopulate vulture communities by...
So uh, thank you very much again for watching. Um, just one, a few uh, concluding words. Um, we at the Leibniz does ISW. We do not conduct research. Uh, we do conduct research that can be the basis for conservation action and political and social decisions in favor of conservation. But we actually we do not make these decisions and we do not change the world alone. For this reason, a strong communication between those who provide the knowledge and tools and those who take conservation act conservation action is uh, very necessary. And I hope that I showed that uh, visual media can help tremendously with that. If you're interested in our uh, visual gateway into our science, uh, consider following our Instagram account. But <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for watching and I'm open for any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for the amazing presentation. We don't have any questions in the chat. Um, we can wait a few seconds because we have this time delay. <laughs> um, but yeah. Otherwise, I would suggest that we um, first continue with Sonia. And if any other questions come up um, for Jan, just feel free to write them in the chat and I will read them out loud after the next talk. Okay, thank you. Yes, so I will introduce Sonia de Jesus Fontes, our next speaker. She's a Portuguese veterinarian with a particular interest in the field of wildlife conservation. As a young student, she did volunteer work at the Rehabilitation and Release Wildlife Center in Lisbon. And Sonia went to obtain her master degree at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research working on the reproductive management of captive elephants. For the past years, she has been committed to investigating possible hereditary and environmental factors involved in a viral disease responsible for the death of many Asian elephant calves, both in zoological institutions and in the wild. At the moment, she is finishing her doctoral studies at Leibniz ICW on the epidemiology and coagulation status impact in an elephant herpes virus disease in Asian elephants. She looks forward to continuing working and helping to improve wildlife conservation in her future. And I think I'm not exaggerating when I say that Sonia, with her enthusiasm for conservation, has inspired or infected all of the speakers of this afternoon to participate in this event. So <laughs> special thanks to Sonia. And Sonia, now we are more than happy to get some insights into your work. And the title of your talk is Zoo Elephant Research and Contribution to Their Wide Range Country Cousins. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So, and you can see my screen. So, yes, thank you so much for everyone that is here. I was checking the Menti survey and we have a lot of answers. So that's very nice to see you interacting with us. So I know that uh, my talk is on uh, zoo research, but I got really distracted with something really important, which I believe is extremely, extremely valuable, a value to, to explain in detail. And this is it. Oi. This is it. So this is elephant dung, poo, or uh, elephant eggs, as some, some uh, people like to call it. And I, I ask you, like, what, what do you see when you look at this beautiful picture? Because I really see an entire ecosystem. And I'm going to try to explain to you how important even the pool of elephant is. So elephants, uh, they transport their seeds, transport seeds of several plant species in their dung and uh, can re reju rejuvenate an entire habitat. In this uh, article of the Mega Gardeners, the author also states that African elephants may consume more seeds from more species of plants than any other taxon of large vertebrate dispensers, defecating them over long distances in viable conditions into nutrient-rich and protective dung. So one other very important job of the elephant poo is to serve as food. So several animals feed on elephant dung, including birds, monkeys, and a whole bunch of insects. 
such as the dung beetle and the termites. So as you can see, this dung is filled with life. Another interesting fact is that uh, different species of frogs were found to shelter in, in the elephant dung, in these amazing roundhouses. And more is now being studied to understand this interaction with the frogs as they start being more and more considered as important animals for vector, uh, for, for the control of disease that are transmitted by vectors, like for example, the mosquitoes. So, Besides all of these uh, very important facts, I also knew that they were making uh, poo paper and they were kind of using digested coffee beans, but there was something I did not know. Now they are also producing gene out of poo. So although this is a very recent news that was produced uh, in the beginning of this year, CNN business is already checking it out. So it might be very important for the future. So gene lovers, you can also be part of this important ecosystem. Now, another use of elephant dung, which is totally not supported by science, and I got <laughs> very uh, surprised by, was this uh, speculation that elephant dung could cure COVID-19. And it's fantastic because the poop price went from one euro to around five euros. And I, I even had like no idea that you could sell elephant poop. And I wonder like how far could it reach in, in terms of uh, money, you know? And also, I just really wanted to share this so we can all right now imagine for one moment that people, instead of poaching elephants for their tusks and their body parts, that they would actually keep and protect elephants as a dung therapeutical resource. So it's not only about their poo, but also, for example, their food, food tracks, which play an important role as they create water holes, for example, that are used for frog nurseries. And you see like in the image below, the little legs. Elephants also dig water holes with their tusks. When the rainfall is really low and the land is really dry, and this will allow like other wildlife to drink from it. So they are also considered keystone species. For example, the African elephant, the, the way of uh, their feeding behavior keeps the savanna a grassland rather than a forest, like we have seen before for the Asian elephant. And these, the grassland will, will sustain the, the grassing for many like antelopes, wild beasts, zebras, but also will help predators like lions and hyenas, since they depend on the savanna to find the prey. <clears throat> so they are, it's because of all of this that um, uh, elephants are like important to mention. They are not only keystones, and I'm sorry, I will explain. So keystones is a species that um, if it would disappear, no other species could fill its environmental role. Uh, the entire ecosystem would have to change radically and there would be the possibility of like an invasive uh, species that would take over the habitat. And um, elephant is also considered an umbrella species since um, so many other species depend on him. As we have seen, he's also an ecosystem engineer, he changes the landscape, and he's also considered a flagship species because he's charismatic and he's used as kind of a face for fundraising and uh, getting awareness on conservation. But still with all of this, um, uh, with all of these uh, potentialities and importance of, of elephants, this is the reality right now. All of our elephant species, they are threatened with extinction. For the African forest and the African bush uh, elephants, they are, they are vulnerable to extinction. And when it comes to the Asian elephant, they are endangered or critically endangered of becoming extinct. So now I will talk to you a bit more of the zoo elephant research and how it can contribute. And I'm going to use a specific example of uh, one disease, which is called elephant and teleotropic herpes virus, which is a, a disease I'm, I have been working on during my doctor hunt, the, the, the PhD. So the elephant and herpes virus 
is a species specific virus. So that means that uh, elephants have their elephant species, like humans have herpes virus and dogs have herpes virus. So this is only affects elephants and it, it's uh, causing more uh, fatalities in the Asian elephant, especially in, in the very young calves. We know that the virus is everywhere. We do have healthy elephants shedding without any showing any problems or symptoms. And um, we still don't understand many things about it, and especially why does it affect some animals and not others. So, also we have no vaccination and there is no prevention so far that would stop an elephant from getting infected or disposing the, the uh, presenting the, the disease. So I promise you this is the only like bloody picture I'm gonna use during my presentation, but I think it's also important for you to understand how impactful it is. So this is what zoos were facing. The, initially the elephant was fine in the morning and it would be dead in the afternoon. It will come really fast, really fulminant. And this is what they would see. It creates a hemorrhagic syndrome. You can see, like for example, the blue cyanotic trunk, it happens due to the blood vessels getting destroyed and the blood comes out also around the heart, very diffuse hemorrhages. You see on the right side also a damaged vessel and you see also the, in the elephant a uh, huge edema of the face and in the forelimbs because the, the vascular system is not working correctly so a lot of liquid gets accumulated and uh, that's basically the, the scenario. And yes, uh, most of them would die. Nearly every, all of them would die. At the moment, uh, recent studies show that one in every two cows that die, die with herpes virus. And this is like the, the recent publication for the, the captive North American population and European population. So it's very, yeah, impactful in the, in the captive population, but also wildlife, vet, wildlife vets suspect a very high mortality rate in their Asian elephants in the, in the range countries. But often they, they're, they have many like logistical limitations that um, don't allow them to monitor the herpes virus when it's being shed and, uh, and also to, to confirm the cases. It's hard because they have um, difficulties in accessing the samples or even diagnostic them, diagnosticing them, making the diagnose through the PCR technique. So most knowledge was actually achieved due to research in zoological institutions. And why? Basically due to the possibility to, the, to get easy access to samples. Due to, due to this uh, proximity to have elephants like giving us blood in a normal procedure that is part of their medical daily checkup. So for all the vets that are listening, just imagine how fantastic it would be then when you have a cat in the in the clinic to just please ask him nicely and give him some treats for him to give you the paw and you could take some blood yes and possible um but this this um easy access to samples really changed everything and uh, also allowed laboratory techniques so the pcr techniques to be developed faster and now we understand that changes in some parameters like for example a drop in the platelets or in the monocytes are a very alert sign. We know that the viremia will rise even before the, the symptoms um, uh, start appearing and this allows us to give a more proactive treatment. And with all of this new knowledge, it has all already uh, led to, to an increase of the survival rates. Right now we have um, many cases of survival uh, calves. So, Using zoo animals helped uh, a lot to, to, to gather like all of this knowledge in a new disease that was causing a lot of fatalities. And, and, um, and, and all this uh, knowledge, of course, this is truly international effort, but with this, uh, with the use of zoo animals, the, the guidelines were created. And right now there is also a very interesting study, study where they are testing, um, um, so they want to develop the technique uh, using fecal samples and plants that the, the elephants were chewing on to, to be able to, to detect the herpes virus in a non-invasive way. So it can also be used in the wild elephant populations. And if you're interested in this disease or you want to know more about it, 
I truly uh, recommend this website. It uh, has a lot of information and for veterinarians, you can also have um, a professional uh, content. You just need to, to apply for it. So last year, this uh, uh, article also came out and is really is exactly on zoo research, uh, elephant research, and I truly recommend. Uh, they make a very nice review on all the contributions that zoo elephant research has made to conservation, and also touch on many topics of uh, research with high importance to the captive and free ranging elephants. I mean, this table I took from there, and I think it's really nice reading and also opens a lot of doors for whoever is interested in in doing elephant research because it shows how much we still have to go but also taking from it like uh, in giving you more examples of how elephants in zoos have helped one of the examples is uh, on um on the, the the milk substitutes for a lot of studies were made in a milk composition um that um due to the captive breeding programs we were able to gather a lot of um, knowledge in it. And now we are uh, allowed us like to, to improve the hand rearing protocols for orphans, calves. When it comes also to reproduction, Dr. Thomas Hildebrandt has already told you so much about it, but it was um, um, uh, really important that, um, I mean, it is a possibility that the captive population will be a resource of elephants for reintroduction into the wild if the population, wild population keeps on dropping. And of course, if there is a sust uh, sustainable uh, habitat that will be available, but uh, we need to gather knowledge on it. And it's, it's also important to refer that um, 30 years ago, almost nothing was known on it. And through the work with, of Dr. Thomas and many other, of course, vets and experts, now, more than 50 babies were born um, through artificial inter um, insemination worldwide. So, and of course, I am um, talking mainly about zoos, but zoos uh, are not the only solution, but you have, we have to see them as part of an entire group of um, like measures and actions that will aid conservation. And of course, I'm referring to elephants but it is just one of the so many examples of species that are facing extinction and i truly hope like that people will care and understand our importance and that we keep on pushing to ban the commercial trade of elephant parts and the ivory market and sport hunts so to my eyes zoos are really important and i think this picture really manifests the why. It's, zoos have this wow effect on people. They are the educators. They reach thousands and thousands of people of any background and social economical class. They produce more than 50,000 scientific publications, which brings a lot of valuable knowledge. And also, uh, for example, in zoonotic diseases, they also help to rescue wildlife in emergency situations, as we all remember, of the koalas during the, the fires. And they protect and breed animals that are threatened in the wild and reintroduce them, restoring their populations. So this is also something that I wanna talk about, which I think it's super fantastic. I know I've been talking about one of the most beautiful creatures in the world, but we should also remember the ugly animals out there. And Simon Watts is the founder of the Ugly Animal Preservation Society. <laughs> and uh, he, maybe some of you might, might have seen him and he was part of the Natural History um, uh, TV, was a presenter and he was part of the Inside Nature's Gigants documentaries. Um, and he created this competition to choose the most, the favorite ugly animal. And the winner was Blobfish, I guess. Blobfish is the flagship species of the ugly animals, but is there to, 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 remem to remind us that every species is truly important. So, before I conclude, I just would like to show you in this nice GIF that one of uh, the best illustrations I know have made. Uh, you can see the black-footed ferret, the corner blue butterfly, the red wolf, the regent 
honey heater. And these are only four examples of species that were brought back from extinction by Zeus. And we have to remember that they do have this power. Also, the polar bear is there to, well, because it's uh, to remind us of a critical problem that is putting all species endangered. So the polar bear is basically the flagship species associated with climate change. And with this, I also would like to remind us all that, so zoo animals are called the ambassadors of their wild species, but they truly are helping conservation of many other species and granting a more biodiverse world. So I challenge you all to take the time to visit our local animal heroes and thank them for being so important for conservation. And with this, I thank your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Sonia. That was a very great talk. Um, so we don't have any questions so far, but a comment from Sarah um, who says, um, especially ele elephants look always so sad in zoos, no space, no toys, etc. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, I will not talk. It depends on the zoos to start from. And uh, it's a bit hard to understand like when an animal is being sad or happy just by their face. It's not that they have so many facial expressions like we do. How do you judge if an animal is sad? Uh, but uh, I do not believe so. Like for example, one of the, that we can consider a happiness uh, achievement is when they breed naturally. And we do have zoos that they breed naturally, and we know that only occurs when they are not hungry, not thirst, not scared, not stressed. And uh, I think that's also a good indicator, for example. And uh, then I would suggest to see more zoos. Yeah, good point. Sarah, do you want to comment on this? No. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, um, we don't have any other questions. And also not for the previous talk. So that's why I think we can move on to the next one and the last one, which is from Katharina Hermann. Yes, and it's again my pleasure to introduce her. So Katharina Hermann has been interested in animals in general and zoos in particular since early childhood. Before and during her bachelor's degree in wildlife management at the University of Van Hol Larenstein in the Netherlands, Katharina completed various internships, for example, in the animal care department at Berlin Zoo. She has also conducted field research on wild chimpanzee groups in Uganda and worked in the population management team at Taronga Zoo in Sydney. After graduating with a Master of Science degree in zoo conservation biology from the University of Plymouth, UK, Katharina worked for the European Zoo and Aquaria Association in the animal programs and conservation team. Her role was to help the more than 400 member zoos to optimally manage the, their ex situ programs and thus contribute to the long-term preservation of threatened animal species and ecosystems. Since April 2020, she works as conservation coordinator for Berlin Zoo and Tierpark Berlin. Now we are looking forward to your talk, Katharina, entitled Conservation Work at Zoo Berlin and Tierpark Berlin. Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Katharina Hermann, and as I was introduced, I'm the conservation coordinator in the neighbor institution to the Institute in Zoom Wildlife Service. I'm working at Berlin Zoo and Berlin Tier Park, and Berlin Tier Park is next to the Isaac W. So we are actually neighbors. So I would like to take you on today in a 20 minute short session on the conservation work we are doing here in Berlin, and I would actually like to focus more on the reintroduction projects. So going back to Sonia's talk, what are our super local heroes are doing for our species in the world? But first of all, I would like to show you this picture and it shows you a truck, but actually this truck was something very, very exciting about for all of us. And it took years of work to get this truck where you can see it now on this road. And who's in that track and what this track is going to be 
I will show you during my talk at a later stage. As my pre-speakers talked about is we know that we have an incredibly rich and diverse variety of species on our planet. And every year, thousands of these species disappear for forever. Extinction is forever. It's not bringing them back. The IUCN Red List, that's the body of the um, different experts actually assessing the threats to these species and status different species have, assessed every couple of years how many plant and animal species are known with the knowledge we have as of that day are threatened with extinction. And by so far, we know that also hundreds of species got extinct purely by us, by our human activity. And the numbers are increasing with every research we are doing together and every mission we are conducting into the big jungles of the world or into the Arctic and the deep, deep oceans. So what do zoos contribute to species conservation? And this is a topic Sonia obviously raised a little bit and I would like to dive more into that. Zoos have a conservation role, and the public recognizes us as a conservation body. A recent further study done by the AUDZ, the German Zoo Association, conducted that 91% of the interviewed public people actually consider zoos to be very, very important to conserve species from extinction. So how do we do that? As we heard before, we actually are not doing that by ourselves. Not a single institution can achieve something by only single man or woman power. No, we are all part of a wider network. For example, the zoos in Europe are members in, when they are in Germany, mainly in the German Zoo Association. But we are also part of the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, a combination of more than 400 institutions across Europe working together for the same aims. For example, in breeding programs coordinated by coordinators and various zoos to achieve the general aim. And across the globe, we are also working together under the umbrella of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, BASA. But zoos are only one side of the picture. And while we have expertise in keeping threatened species alive and flourishing in our environment and exceeding, we actually need help to help them in the wild in situ, which means this is something outside of our gate, something we only have limited access to. And this is where non-governmental organizations on the ground, like for example in Africa, Wild Nature Institute with their giraffe project, the IUCN with their various, various other research projects, also informing the redness comes into place. Together under the framework of this called one plan approach, we are working together. So it's not only zoos, it's not only in situ body, no, it's both of us together, which creates a full picture. So together, zoos and aquaria, we acknowledge that we actually are the heroes and the champions for the species kept under human care. This is where we can actually shine and be brilliant on. So together, we are protecting species through the professional management of ex situ populations, where we are taking care of genetic diversity, and are uh, managing the populations in, uh, in a way they stay healthy and demographic variable for long term. We as zoos also acknowledge our field project partners as being the resource on the ground, so we see how we can provide them best with financial and human resources to help them. Where possible, we conduct research to get valuable insight into the protection of species. And on the slide, you can see our giraffe male Max who was testing out a camera, which was later used in Tanzania for field research. So he was carrying that around for a couple of days to see um, how the images were being broadcasted. We are also aligning our power and conservation campaigns on international level to draw the attention of millions of millions of visitors. And wherever possible, we collaborate. The reintroduction of captive bred animals into their native range is actually only a tiny percentage of the conservation work we are doing, but obviously it's a very, very important one. By the way, 
we actually need to shout far more better from the rooftops what we do. And therefore, the European Association of Using Aquaria is running a conservation database where all of us who's being a member of that organization can enter our support to conservation. So, so far we know, obviously not everybody has entered the work, but that we reached out to more than 600 partners and helped so far more than 600 species only in the year 2019. And EADA is accumulating all of this knowledge and data and is sharing it also with legal bodies. So together, as all of those institutions, we have a bigger effort than if one of us would do all this work alone. So let's talk about the reintroduction project. Here in Berlin, in Berlin Zoo and Berlin Tierpark, we are actually very excited that we can contribute to conservation of European native species. And here today, I have brought you two projects we're working with. One is the project of the Wild Vulture Conservation, Vulture Conservation Foundation, where they're working with little vultures. And the other project is done by WWF Germany and WWF Romania on the return of the bison to the soil kite. Here on the picture, you two see uh, two people from the Vulture Conservation Foundation actually holding two bearded vulture sticks. And the Vulture Conservation Foundation is a major NGO to reinstate population of vultures back in natural range. So all European vulture species have a highly vulnerable status and their hab habitat is constantly changing. So due to illegal poisoning, um, lack of food, um, collision with power lines, you know, electrical execution, the vulture populations across Europe are constantly declining. And those declining population actually created isolated populations. So those different populations couldn't interact. And then genetic diversity was shrinking, demography reduced, and we saw a lower reproductive rate year after year after year. Vultures, also especially the bearded vultures, are keystone species in European mountain landscapes. They cut the vector of infectious disease transmission and they're acting as um, target recyclers and also for the local public to have a high value to the landscape and living. So protecting vultures in the end does not mean only protecting a species. No, it actually means protecting the whole, the whole European mountain ecosystem. It's more than that. So the Bearded Vulture Project, led by uh, Vulture Conservation Foundation, involves a total of 40 zoos up to date, five specialist breeding centers, and different subgroups on the ground of experts. The aim of all this work is to foster the exchange between those two populations in the Pyrenees and the Alps, and we are reintroducing captive bred birds into those landscapes. So what does it mean? The birds are not coming from like somewhere, they're not flying out of the sky. You know, they're actually coming from those specialized breeding centers on those 40 European zoos participating in this initiative, which means that this breeding program coordinated by the coordinator is telling all the zoos every year on a certain amount to breed the birds. And then actually the chicks being fledged are taken to the project. But Till the fledging, it's a long way of work, and I would like to show you in a second a little video how a chick, a healthy chick, actually looks like. So far, we have already bred in the whole project 300 vultures, whereof 21 vultures came from Berlin Vulture Park. So the whole project of 300 vultures is running since 30 years only, and so 21 birds hatched in Berlin Tier Park were all successfully reintroduced over the past 30 years. And here on this video, you can see a bunch of chick from actually this spring. being hatched. What happens next in a reintroduction project? So after our veterinary team estimates a chick for being suitable for reintroduction, which means it's healthy, 
we actually transport chick to the reintroduction site. From the reintroduction site, where the chick is still at an age of about three months, so which means the chick is not able to fly, it needs to be transferred to a resting site where it then will take in its own speed the decision to fly, which can take a couple of weeks. This also means the chick cannot just be released somewhere in the native range. It needs to be a secure and careful spot, where also in case it's not adapting to the local food resources quickly, we have an, an option and a way to get to it. So in this video, I would like to show you that how one of the chicks coming from you actually is transported to the introduction site and how this looks. This is a lot of effort and also needs preparation and after release monitoring for you. So this is um, not something you're just doing within a week, it takes months. So yes, so uh, first of all, obviously, thank you, Walter Conservation Foundation, for this beautiful video summarizing what is going on in the field. And as you can imagine, this is something you do not see like every day. And this is also a high precious moment for us from the zoo that after years and years of breeding, finally the chick bred by the suitable parents is being released and had a chance of flying wild. As you see on this picture, that's one of the chicks which has been released like last year. So for that project, we are very, very excited to be a participant in, and we would like to be continuing involved in this project in the future. Another project very close to our heart is actually the European Bison Reintroduction Project. As you might know, is that European Bison is the biggest plant eater in Europe, and due to the mass massive hunting of the populations of this herd living mammal, the population was reduced end of the 19th century, where we only had two populations left in nature, one in Berlovetsa forest and one in the Western Caucasus area. So this big massive herds actually were reduced to two populations and two sites. In 1927, the species was also officially then declared extinct in the world, which means there were only European bison left in zoological institutions. Luckily, there were about 70 animals kept in various European institutions. And this species was because they were kept there safe from extinction. So our European bison population is going back from those 70 animals. Today, we have many reintroduction efforts for European bison all across its native range and group. And there are many herds now actually going over the plains. So the project Berlin Zoo and Berlin Tierpark is involved in is actually a project by WWF Germany and WWF Romania, the Romanian um, the government of Azerbaijan, and the breeding program, which is again like with the bearded vulture, a person in a zoo trying to coordinate our conservation efforts for the species across all zoos who are participating. Until now, we had more than 200 European bison grown in Berlin. We are very proud that later this year, one of the first Berlin-born animals will actually be going to be reintroduced. And where are we reintroducing currently? As I said, there are many projects, but for last year and the coming years, we are working together with institutions in Shagdang National Park in Azerbaijan. And this area, because of its 
hilliness and vegetation you can see on this picture provide the perfect circumstances for European bison. So how does it work when introducing? Us in Berlin, we are kind of a specialist in bringing bison from different origins together to accumulate a herd of those and then actually tra transporting them to the reintroduction site, which means we had bison from various institutions coming to Berlin. They all got acquainted with each other in our uh, lush outside enclosure. And then after a couple of months together, they were all transported together as a herd to the reintroduction site. Important to know is why we need to get them acquainted to each other. The reason is that we want to avoid that once they are released in the national park, they're dispersing into different directions. So that they should stay together as a herd, have the safety of the herd, because this gives us a higher chance of survival. Obviously, you need several animals to reproduce. So here in tier park, then the animals are created and then transported by air by a dedicated a knowledgeable team to the reintroduction side. And I would like to thank WWF for this picture compilation, by the way, because again, this is something you do not make pictures of that easily, as normally when you have those situations going on, there is all men and women work needed and nobody has a camera around. So, and here is the truck. So this was actually the truck transporting the four bison we transported last year to Shakhtar National Park in Azerbaijan. And this was, as I said before, months of work to get it arranged, get the paperwork ready, get the animals ready, have the animals in the, in the nice state that they have a good journey and have them arrange, arriving in the National Park itself. So once the animals are arriving, they're actually unloaded and there are another veterinary checks done. That's why we always have keepers and veterinarians on the ground and obviously the different project partners all taking care of all the animals. And then depending how the reintroduction is going, you either reintroduce the animals directly or you have something like type of a soft release in a pre-setting pre release enclosure. So on the pictures on this side, you actually see there are some pre-release enclosures where all the animals were uncreated in and then they could spend their um, a big amount of time in to get pointed to the different area around them and get relaxed from the journey themselves, which obviously gives us a good idea on checking on the animals again. So while the animals are there on the ground, there's also the whole process going on of a safe release. Obviously, you do not want the animals to run to go into the wrong direction. This needs careful planning. So therefore at the border of the national park, where it's a good site to, to have the animals to release them, there is like a gate constructed. You can see here a wooden gate and the area then surrounded is um, closed off for the public to give the animals the quality and time to actually go out of those boxes themselves. The crates are then transported to the entrance of the of the, of the gate and as you can see here on this picture are released. On some bison we are putting GPS tracking to be able to get the data where they're roaming to and where they're heading to and some other animals are just marked for us with numbers and we are noting down who they're looking like for later distinguishing and collecting this field data you also heard for other species about earlier today. So actually what you see on this picture is all what we are working for, is having the bison released and having them in the national park and their native range where they originally belong to. Oh, oh one second. Just would like to go back one slide. So we know that the species are disappearing but we know that we can put a halt to this if we all work together. Be it of breeding species together in an organized way, be it of releasing them, reintroducing them to the wild, or just contributing with our knowledge as group for field monitoring, as you can see on the picture on the right-hand side of the Great Buster. As long as we work together and we're exchanging our knowledge, we can make it happen. If you like more information on all the other conservation projects we are doing in Berlin Zoo and Berlin Tier Park, 
just visit our website you find little notes on all the different projects because today there was obviously not enough time for me to highlight them all but we also have interesting videos and background information on them for all who are interested so thank you very much for listening and if you have any questions i'm looking forward to answering them uh, yeah, thank you, Katarina. That was a very exciting talk. Um, we don't... Oops. <laughs> we don't... <laughs> the microphone was loud. Um, we don't have any questions from the audience so far. Do we have questions from our group in here? Yes, Sonia. Actually, I would like to ask, and I'm sorry if I miss it, but how many years did it took from the concept of the of the reintegration project until uh, really re reaching the release of the animals? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So depending on the species, it can take months up to years. Obviously, in a population that like the bearded vulture, if you were looking into that bird, we have a European breeding program who decided 30 years ago together with the Vulture Conservation Foundation to release birds. So since 30 years, they're releasing birds. But picking the genetic, diverse and suitable birds for this area and ensuring that this area is secured takes also another year. So it's partly parallel progresses. Okay. So, so how many percent of your budget you spend in uh, conservation projects? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. Um, good question. So, to be honest, this varies every year, as we obviously, with our experience and our knowledge, certain things cannot be budgeted for. Sending keepers down to a project is something, obviously, we pay the keepers their the salaries, but this is money we are investing in experience and knowledge, which is not budgeted for in the normal conservation budget fields. But I'm aware that the European Zoo Association is currently trying to come up with a definition if there is a way to translate that into money. Thank you, Katarina. Um, yeah, still no questions from the audience, but everybody liked your talk, <laughs> as they are saying. Um, yeah, then I think, yeah, oh, Sonia, you have one? No? No, if there are no more questions then i would uh, propose that we do a more um, another final interactive uh, little survey i thank you katarina so much for showing the importance of zeus and everything that you guys are doing and all the efforts that you put in it so i would need to share my screen please i thank you all for being with us all the speakers you are so fantastic it was so nice and um, as you can still ask some questions to all the speakers that are still here. Opala, where is my screen? So I would invite all of you to join us again on Menti and use the same code. But now the question I make is what have you learned or what is conservation for you? Did it change something in what you believe that conservation was? And so please just join us with that we'd like to see a lot of inspiring words and um, if you still have more questions we will still stay a bit longer in here and also you can always contact any of the speakers through their emails if you don't have them then you can contact izw we will give you i'm sure katarina will also be available to answer to more um questions that you might have and I hope that you enjoyed. Let us know. Let us. Would you admit your expectations? Would you like some other topics to be brought up in a conservation um, talk? So, Sonia, thank you thank for you. organizing all this. Thank you. I'm happy it was really to. Pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> Money. That's a good one. Yes people mindset so i actually i would like also to share i was into putting into my presentation but the time was short that i also really like or it's impactful to me that um the the most uh, um icon people like david hattenberg and and jane godel that were people that live like 
they have triple of my 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 age and and there were people that were born when the human population was half and 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 the, the species the vertebrate species was doubled so they truly in an elegant way are still in an elegant way they are screaming for us to take action and i would like to remind all of us that it is really up to us it and that i truly believe that if everyone has a changes a little bit then all together we might make a change it's not just to powerful um people they they do also have to make changes but i believe that if your passion moves you to do photography filmmaking science then you should really go for it with always remembering that we all every day do play a part in it and we are part we are animals so never think that there will be people and animals we are all integrated one and so yes let's all try to do a bit more of our part and reduce our impact everyone has it of course me as well but it would be great that we could do which i believe we can do a much better job and hope to change all of it for the best people are not so inspired but we have a lot of a nice cloud already yeah, mind setting for true only future true yes communication commitment very nice also for your commitment to be with us i think it was really nice that you took your time to listen to us make us some questions and get to learn a bit more of um conservation and what conservation is done in berlin which is the purpose of the berlin science week to to spread uh what what institutes what uh um and how much science is in this city and how how much people are progressing knowledge um in berlin uh, do any other of the speakers would like to make any comments or <laughs> i'm lacking ideas yeah we, we are open for donations of uh, uh research for conservation but we are also open to to offer uh, a PhD works or master works. So, so you just have to contact us. But I guess we need to to provide a email for that one. <laughs> we can put in the YouTube um, group. Yes, but which one? The live sharing one. I know, but which email shall we provide? Ah, yours? <laughs> for, for, for human resources, you, you, you could provide um, uh, Stephanie Vollberg. Can you write it down in the, in the YouTube, please? Steven? Yeah, and, and for general questions, you can write my email. Okay, thank you. So any more comments from the YouTube? I'm sorry, I'm not following the live stream because of the difference in time. Uh, no, we don't have any further questions from the audience. Okay, then I also, yeah, would like to advise everyone to keep on following the program of the World Science Submit 2020 in Berlin um, Science Week because they have so many interesting um, events going on until the 10th of November and I guess that's it I think it was very uh, productive uh, event and talks we're happy that you were all here I will stop sharing my screen <laughs> and then we can, can all see I, li I like to thank as well Paul Josepha and Sarah Kiefer who did yeah. all the background work yes I think thank it's you. a very nice team thank you guys it was fantastic. Then uh, maybe we can all say goodbye together and uh, Bye. meet you all next time. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a great day and thank you for everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, Bye. Thank you. Just have a. <laughs>